Welcome, friends and comrades, to another panel discussion hosted by the International Manifesto Group, this time in conjunction with the Critical Theory Workshop and the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. The advance of socialist forces has, historically, featured an alliance between small but critical groups of intellectuals and the masses of workers. Marx and Lenin spoke of it. Gramsci spoke of an alliance between those who suffer because they think and those who think because they suffer. The Fabian spoke of an alliance of brains and numbers. The alliance of the thinkers with the left was such as to lead John Stuart Mill to call the conservative party of his country the stupid party. Today, however, even as the, even as, uh, the class of intellectuals or the educated has expanded to become a veritable professional managerial class, that alliance appears to have broken down. The vast majority of the educated classes express their own class interests and that of the corporate capitalist class and are split, if at all, um, only among parties that represent corporate capitalist interests. Why is this? What is the resulting set of political alliances of the educated? What are the consequences? Should and can we rectify this? This is the subject of today's webinar. I will be doing the moderating. My name is Carlos L. Garrido. I'm a Cuban American philosophy instructor at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, the director at the Midwestern Marx Institute, and the author of various books, including The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism, Marxism and the Dialectical Materialist Worldview, and the forthcoming Hegel, Marxism and Dialectics. Our speakers for today are Glenn Dyson, Noah Krashevik, Gabriel Rockhill, myself, and Radhika Desai, in that order. So we'll get started with uh, Glenn Dyson. Uh, who is a professor at the University of Southeastern Norway and an editor of the Russia in Global Affairs Journal. You can follow him on Twitter, of course, at Glenn Dyson. Um, that's uh, Glenn with two N's and Dyson, I-E. Uh, so, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. You can get started with your presentation. Uh, thank you so much. So, <clears throat> yes, I was asked to speak uh, a bit about uh, some work I've been doing uh, lately on think tanks and how they are... Uh, I guess it corrupted a lot of the the knowledge and uh, uh, about well how how knowledge itself is produced and then uh, especially focusing on uh, how this uh, think tank industry has uh, influenced uh, American policies mm -hmm. towards uh, Russia. So uh, so my main argument has been that think tanks uh, has a tendency to corrupt uh, knowledge itself as uh, uh, the making. Uh, well, the production of knowledge decided to some extent by market forces, which is, uh, uh, again, the unfettered markets uh, at its uh, extremes. So <clears throat> so I wouldn't say that think tanks uh, would inherently be bad, uh, merely, uh, I would say, corrupted. Uh, traditionally, I think uh, think tanks has been this, can be considered a bridge between academia and decision makers. That's how it started and was intended. So uh, while academics tend to be very focused on you know development of theories uh, you know uh, how methods are uh, developed uh, often uh, they tend to be very specifically focused on single topics and it's not al always that easy to have this cooperation with decision makers and um, and uh, i think uh, uh, decision makers have a need for expert opinions simply because as the world grew increasingly complex over the past hundred years especially politicians uh, needed effectively to make decisions on on everything from you know fiscal policies uh, you know foreign policies towards uh, you know everything from Argentina to uh, to Ethiopia so it's uh they're expected to know uh, a lot of information uh, also in the United States, this is happening at a time when one gets the impression that politicians actually sometimes know less as, and a lot of their time is actually spent on uh, campaigning for funds. So I think this is the problem. They, they, there was a need for this to, to have uh, these think tanks, again, bridging academia and decision makers uh, originating from a reasonable uh, purpose. Um, mm -hmm. However, I think when they grew in influence, the main problem is that uh, they increasingly began to inform presidential administration. So, uh, they in, they inform Congress with policy papers. Uh, they also begin to dominate in terms of providing expert opinions to the media. 
the, the also even higher, you know, former officials who are currently out of office, almost functioning as a waiting room. And uh, over the years, these uh, think tanks become more and more influential. And uh, keep in mind, this is happening at a time uh, when, uh, yeah, academics might be losing ground, and also uh, print media is uh, losing its influence as well. Meanwhile, you have this increasingly well-funded, powerful think tanks capable of producing knowledge. And you know, if the story ended there, it could be seen as they were filling a gap. Um, but again, if you control the production of knowledge, uh, there's an immense power. Uh, so this is the people, again, providing information to politicians, to the media, to shape also not just the politicians' opinions, but also the public's opinion. So this can reach a level when, you know, to what, to what extent doesn't matter who's elected if you can actually control the information they act upon. And so as these uh, think tanks became more and more powerful, we also see that they became more and more politicized. So you have the ones on the left, you have the ones on the right. So to a large extent, the conclusions which these uh, you know, research centers have to uh, investigate, they already kind of have the conclusions they want. And often the, some of the task is to get information to support these conclusions. <laughs> and again, as these uh, think tanks gain more and more power, and influence, uh, it begs the question, who would like to fund a think tank, you know, who has academic interests, sorry, economic interests? Uh, when it comes to domestic policy, it's one thing, but if we look at foreign policy, uh, who has uh, economic interest in influencing foreign policy by controlling the production of knowledge? Well, I guess, you know, obviously the arms industry would be the key candidate. And as we see, this is the one who's dominating the funding of virtually all the think tanks uh, mm -hmm very much funded by the arms industry. And again, this is what uh, Eisenhower was uh, warning about in 61 as well in his farewell speech about the military industrial complex. He had actually first uh, referred to it in his note as the military industrial congressional complex, but uh, allegedly to avoid alienating <laughs> Congress, uh, you know, he left out the congressional part. But this is, uh, of course, uh, I think a mistake because um, but this is uh, think tanks show then uh, how they become a key institution to uh, for how the arms industry can obtain political influence. Mm -hmm. Now, I've often seen in the media and interviews that this is almost a conspiracy theory to suggest that uh, immense, huge industry uh, would somehow pursue their own business interests by by looking for military solutions to foreign policy questions. And I think, uh, again, it, it becomes absurd because uh, I think uh, what we've seen, for example, in the United States, when war tends to become the solutions to all problems, uh, the first solution instead of the last, uh, it's it's often one, one can trace back the information, to, well, the influence to these think tanks. And, uh, uh, for example, during the Ukraine war, look at the, the media who has so who gets their advice from the think tanks. Uh, virtually in all, all instances, they are always for more weapons, more weapons, no negotiations. So there, there, there's a clear cor correlation between the the, the 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 knowledge or information or policy papers produced by think tanks and the interest of the ones who fund them. Again, it should be common sense. Um, and this is the problem uh, when you put the... Uh, foreign policy for sale effectively by market forces so the ones who produce your knowledge can now effectively buy that knowledge and uh, it used to be more stealthy but uh, even uh, leading figures within the think tank industries which have been critical of this development recognize that uh, the think tanks these days they don't even bother to uphold the solution of being uh, of providing objective analysis you know they and same uh, the, the the politicians as well as often in the media there's a preference often for you know these uh, think tankers who can provide these easy narratives you know often cliches about these struggles between good versus evil as opposed to the complexities uh, which we often get from the academics uh, also the think tanks can be you know conceptualized as an excellent prop uh, a propaganda industry to some extent as well because what we learn from propaganda is source credibility is key. That is, uh, it's not uh, what information you communicate, but it's also who communicates it. So the fact that uh, all of this information, which is being fed to the media, fed to politicians, Congress, 
uh, it all comes from you know this uh, presented almost as uh, independent uh, institutions academic institutions it uh, helps to make it seem as if this is not just uh, uh, marketing but that it's actually you know that's suggesting that has actually some independent uh, uh, academic uh, uh, approach towards developing uh, knowledge um and this over time you know there has been huge recognition in media as well how they have how these think tanks have acquired a lot of influence uh so for example uh, when obama was elected you know he you know he promised he wanted to end uh, the iraq war uh, but again a lot of people also recognized that the cenas or the center for a new american century uh, had a central role in his uh, in his uh, in his uh, administration it became like you know the obama's foreign policy think tank and um, as the New York uh, the New Yorker also recognized that uh, uh, due to the the huge influence of Sinas in the Obama administration was quite quite instrumental in order for him to effectively effectively walk back a lot of the election promises and um, again my, my my main focus is how these think tanks are co not just corrupting US foreign policy uh, by manipulating information, but also how they specifically influence policies towards Russia, because uh, we have to remember that the Cold War gave gave birth to this, uh, you know, military-industrial complex. It's also the setting in which a lot of these think tanks came up. So you know, th this was a big business, and uh, towards the end of the Cold War, even George Kennan he noted, uh, actually, it's a quote. Uh, we wrote that, uh, yeah. Were the Soviet Union to sink tomorrow under the waters of the ocean, the American military industrial complex would have to go on substantially unchanged until some other adversary could be invented. Anything else would be a, would be an acceptable shock to the American economy because too much of the economy had been built up under the military industrial complex and this had been uh, connected to intrinsically into the uh, political system. Um, and of course, or if you want to revamp or bring back uh, militarization, who, who better than Russia, uh, as this has been a key boogeyman over the years. Of course, the global war on terror, it's, uh, it's, it, had, it had its day in the sun. Uh, but uh, but even the decision to expand NATO, uh, you know, in the 90s, there were, I think it was more honest reporting about this. But in the 90s, from the New York Times to Washington Post, there were many reports uh, how NATO expansion would become a bonanza for the military industrial complex by increasing demand for American military hardware. And we see uh, in terms of the current conflict, for example, in, in Ukraine, uh, we, yeah, we, we see how organizations such as RAND Corporation have produced these reports uh, defined uh, specifically how to weaken Russia by extending it. Uh, you know, they have this chapter by chapter, you know, how can we bleed the Russians? How can we destabilize Russia? How can we make them, uh, you know, uh, promise NATO expansion, give weapons? How can this draw in the Russians so we can bleed them? How can we destabilize Belarus? How can we destabilize Central Asia? How about the uh, uh, Caucasus with Azerbaijan, Armenia, and uh, essentially across the board, uh, Syria, obviously, also coming in. And uh, it's actually interesting because Rand has is probably one of the most uh, central of the of, of the think tanks. And for those who watched Stanley Kubrick's movie, uh, Doctor Strangelove, sorry, Doctor Strangelove, how I learned uh, to stop worrying and love the bomb, that's actually a satire based on the Rand Corporation. And uh, you know, he has a quote. I forgot exactly what it was, but something along, you know, it was supposed to be a satire, but. This is very close to reality. It's almost a documentary how these people uh, think. Um, and again, this is the business of war when that is your business model. And this is also the problem for the think tanks. They made this into a business model. They sell foreign policy, the influence of foreign policy. And the main donor, again, will always be the weapons industry. Um, mm. And a lot of interesting work has been done on this. But we also saw during the Russia Gate era when really the hostility towards Russia really began uh, to intensify in the United States. Uh, we saw the, you know, the, the Brookings Institute, for example. Uh, this is where Victoria Newland has come from. 
uh, you know, helped or had a central role in toppling the, the government in Ukraine in 2014 and continues to have a, a key role. Uh, also from the Brookings Institute, uh, one of the primary researchers uh, of the steel dossier, the the ones who launched this whole thing uh, was, you know, Danchenko was also from the Brookings Institute, uh, sorry, Brookings Institution. Uh, in, in Britain also, you know, also not uh, immune to this. Uh, when we had this crazy reports coming out that, you know, out of the 150,000 Russians living uh, in London, about half of them, 75,000 of them, were supposedly Russian spies. I mean, really insane stuff. This was, you know, from the Henry Jackson Institute, uh, for those who remember the in integrity initiative from the Institute of Statecraft, uh, also uh, you know looked at how uh, uh, of, uh, yeah it was another pro democracy think tank uh, it, it was called, but again it worked uh, was funded by you know government intelligence agencies. It ended up setting up these cluster groups uh, to use you know the journalists they trust, academics, researchers. Uh, lobbyists, think tanks, all and putting them together in order to make fake narratives and uh, essentially create uh, false in uh, uh, yeah, fake knowledge, if you will. And uh, yes, yeah, so the last example, as I think I'm running out of time, uh, is this uh, ISW, which is uh, uh, which well during this war now in Ukraine, uh, the main think tank that everyone goes to to cite what's happening in Ukraine, all the media goes to this same think tank. Uh, it just happens, you know, it's treated as this legitimate uh, institution, which is independent. But again, it's run by Kimberly Kagan and Frederick Kagan, which are these, you know, neocon conservative influencers. Uh, this is Frederick Kagan is the brother of Robert Kagan, uh, uh, you know, and uh, Robert Kagan is also the husband of Victoria Nuland, again, a key had a key role in the coup in 2014. So the fact that you know the husband of uh, Victoria Nuland is the you know the one owning or started this uh, think tank, which is supposed to inform not just the Americans but the whole world about what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, the person who helped to topple the government it, it's really obscene. But uh, yet yeah, this is how the, the creation of knowledge has been uh, yeah corrupted. Sorry, I thought I was gonna do some more, but I think I run out of time, so I'll I'll just cut it there. Thank you so much, Glenn. That was uh, superb. Our next uh, speaker of the day is Noah Krashivik. Uh, Noah is a co-director and theorist of the Midwestern Marx Institute uh, for Marxist theory and political analysis. He's a working class dude and uh, a militant in the Communist Party USA. Noah, um, you can start your presentation now. Where's Noah? Basically, I'm going to start by making everyone or at least myself slightly awkward. Uh, because why not, right? I I always get uh, a, a bit overwhelmed when I'm asked to be on a panel like this. So I find it helpful to just get that part over with right away. I get a huge case of imposter syndrome, and that's the problem. Uh, always, every time, without fail. I mean, here I am with all these people who spent years and years in the academy, years and years deep in study, and they've got all these fancy degrees and done all this brilliant work, and who am I, right? I'm kind of just a dumb ape who swings a hammer for a living, right? I mean, that's literally what I do. I swing a hammer for a living. But I'm a dumb ape who's always had this thirst for understanding things and for fixing what's wrong that I can never quite seem to quench. And so I'm a dumb ape who wakes up at 4 a.m. every morning and I spend the hours before I go to work reading. Right. That's the only time you get a quiet house with a teenage son, by the way, 4 a.m. to 7 a.m., give or take, you know, but I'm not just reading to entertain myself. I'm reading in order to create a greater understanding of the world around me. And that turns into a lot of work, studying, writing, going over my notes and my questions. And this turns into something else over the years. It turns into at least what I hope are insights and taking all this stuff that I've been learning, all this thinking dialectically and understanding how to ascend to the concrete, all that, and trying to work out new theory through it, new theory that's applicable to our particular time and place in the universe. And that's hard to do when you're also worried about working enough hours or swinging enough hammers, in my case, to make sure the bank that doesn't take the house, to make sure the kids have school clothes, and that there's actually food in the fridge, even though 
Uh, now it seems to be priced just out of reach for all of us. Uh, all that, especially when it seems like work takes more and more from you. And even when there's more dollars in your paycheck, uh, what you end up with after that seems to get less and less. These are daily concerns for hundreds of millions of working class Americans right now. So when I was asking myself, what could I possibly add to this conversation with so many brilliant people who are clearly, let's face it, much smarter than myself, I thought that this is what I can add. I can add that unique perspective of the working class that, to jargon it up a little, arrives through the socialization of labor and retention of private ownership in pursuit of the creation of surplus value, or at least the unique perspective of a typical hammer-swinging ape that comes out of all that. So that's what I'm going to try to do, and I'm going to try to keep it brief. Carlos, let me know if I start rambling. When we speak of the working class in the USA, though, there's a few clarifications we first need to make these days. And I mean, we need to clarify this every time, because this is part of the problem we're here to talk about today the schism between intellectuals and the working class. And a lot of that schism rests on distortions. One of the reasons that this schism stays sk schism, schism, schism se separated, sorry, one of the reasons for the separation seems to be that the left has largely forgotten where the working class even is. And it does this because it's forgotten how to analyze class through the Marxist method, through that ascension to the concrete I mentioned. And that's been here from the beginning, really. There are exception, exceptions, of course, but largely, we've had a problem with dogmatism since Marxism came to this country. This is when we get to uh, distortions of dogmatism, mechanism, all the biggies, right? That's how we get there. There's a quote from Lenin from the first part of State and Revolution that sums up the phenomenon rather well, though. Because as we all know, history repeats itself first as tragedy, then as farce. Lenin says... Today, the bourgeoisie and the opportunists within the labor movement concur in this doctoring of Marxism. They omit, obscure, or distort the revolutionary side of this theory, its revolutionary soul. They push to the foreground and extol what is or seems acceptable to the bourgeoisie. All the social chauvinists are now Marxists. Don't laugh. This seems to be happening in a new form, of course, corresponding to the advance of the imperialist system to its fully financialized form and bourgeois ideology into its sort of wokest form, as it's often called, uh, of the 21st century, the stage we're in now. The difference really is only in form though. Essentially speaking, this is the same phenomenon. As we enter into a new era, just as the Bolsheviks did, we see new forms of the same essential phenomena, owing to the general laws of development. Marxism itself is a study of on a higher stage of development, right? In a particular American decaying imperialist form. And so it has different particular characteristics. Our distorters, our falsifiers, they're not even necessarily in the labor movement like Lenin's work. Uh, as our labor movement, especially its radical at one time majority, was sort of hacked to pieces in the last period of history. Uh, I mean, we're seeing a re-radicalization there with things like Sean Payne's UIW, the ALU, all that. But I got to point out right there, more of the parallels of Russia entering a revolutionary era and their trade union movement exploding with militancy as well. But of course, ours is on a higher stage of development. But I'm rambling. I promised I wouldn't do that. Our distorters and falsifiers, they're not part of this resurgent labor movement. They're instead part of the left, you know? Uh, and that gives what they say even less teeth, as this left has become largely divorced from the working classes and so completely powerless to enact real change. And the bourgeoisie and opportunists in the left, whom I genuinely hope are watching this right now, certainly concur in this doctoring and distorting of Marxism, just as they did in Lenin's day. These new distorters, fakes and frauds, many of them connected to establishment institutions, like the academy, media, NGOs, and think tanks, uh, or as Gabriel would call it, the knowledge production apparatus of the ruling class, but also within organizations who call themselves socialist and even communist. They omit, obscure, and distort not only the revolutionary sorrow of Marxism, but uh, everything about it. They steal our symbols and heroes, and like Kautsky tried to do with Marx, turn them into common liberals. 
They use revolutionary sounding words to continually advocate for the ruling class. Or maybe a little more precisely, they live in the world of abstract words and in this way are used by the ruling class to enforce their ideological and theoretical concerns, which are at the same time practical concerns, becoming the vanguard of finance capital. And when the working class uh, hear this essential message, but dressed in clothing that says revolutionary or communist or left or whatever, that creates a big problem. And this is even without going into the particular, you know, corporate media narratives and how expertly they use this, uh, not getting into charlatans like Jordan Peterson or James Lindsay, who are then able to talk about how it, actually the ruling class are all Marxists and communists and they're pushing their agenda on children, right? People see that though. And they see these things actually being pushed on children in public schools, in the media, all over, really. And then they can easily believe the slick hustlers like Peterson who tell them that's Marxism and communism. So they stay as far away from it as possible. And rightly so, if that was what we are. But it isn't what we are. And so it keeps working people away from the only real weapons we have for our liberation. This is why the proletariat largely ignores what they see as the left at the best of times, or even wants nothing to do with it at the worst. Because what is presented to them as left is exactly what the ruling class is giving them. And the distorters and falsifiers I mentioned earlier do nothing but reinforce this. To use a favorite phrase of Jordan Peterson, there is a problem with, quote, postmodern neo Marxists. And despite the programmed falsifier responses that dismiss these valid concerns by the same ideological mistake of similar sounding language they always lean on, calling it a Nazi conspiracy theory, uh, they are genuinely powerful. The issue is they ain't Marxists. They are rabid anti-communists, and we need to figure out a way to draw a line between them and us for good. But that was a big, long ramble. Again, uh, I'm discussing distortions, right? One of the primary distortions of our era is that of what class is. Yeah, it's that big, right? The left has forgotten what class is, seriously, because of this new form of the same problem Lenin was dealing with, because of the distorters, many middle-class people genuinely see themselves as proletarian. This mistake of one-sided empiricism and going by definitions, which puts the idea of a fully formed thing before the content of what creates it, or in this instance, before what creates the proletariat, it tells them that they sell labor power, or usually a vulgarization they consider labor, labor power, and so they're proletarians, right? This is not an ascension to the concrete, my friends. This is lazy thinking, typical of the middle classes. It rests on the surface with no necessity. It is definition mongering. And if we know our angles, we know that definitions are never enough. We must instead understand things from their lowest stage to their highest, if we are to speak of understanding them on a real material level, or really to understand them at all. Uh, I don't think I have to explain what class from the Marxist perspective is, but it's part of a relationship, right? Uh, and something happens to that relationship, to our proletariat around the mid 20th century, right? During this time, huge swaths of our working class lost its proletarian character. Due to a combination of things I don't have time to get into, but at the end of the day, ends up being a product of class struggle combined with the maturation of capitalism into its imperialist phase, creating the centralization of capital necessary for uh, that class struggle to actually win things, right? This huge swap rises up into a working middle class at this time, having secured for itself some measure of stability and the ability to save money and not use its wages up consuming the basic necessities. It was able to buy homes, right? And this comes with debt, which is a large part of what's happening now, but we'll, we'll try to get into that. In a word, it won the American dream, right? When we add the events of technology and globalization into the mix, we get what's often called the PMC, or professional managerial class thrown into the mix. 
and we end up with the late 20th century's middle classes, living that American dream. The white picket fence around the nice house in the suburbs, the retirement plan, the 2.5 kids, the dog, or could have been 2.5 dogs and a kid. I, I forget which one it is. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about, right? The American dream. But that dream is effectively dead in the 21st century. Or maybe a little more precisely, it's been murdered with thousands of tiny little knives stabbing it over and over again as imperialism advanced into its fully financialized stage. And the corpse is now on full display for the American people to see. I have a theoretical pamphlet on this phenomenon coming out soon. Uh, it's what we at the Midwestern Marx Institute call reproletarianization. But this is a part of the general problem that we're discussing. So I needed to give this little bit about it uh, just to get to that. Reproletarianization is nothing other than the same process as the original proletarianization during the advance of industrial capitalism, but on a higher stage of development. Just as the stable middle-class peasants of the early industrial era were proletarianized as the forces of production outmoded the old relations of production and industrial capitalism came into being, our working middle classes are losing that stability and falling down to the level of the proletariat due to a very similar process with many of the same essential outcomes of being proletarian, such as the inability to accumulate anything past means of consumption, or to put it in common language we hear all the time, struggling paycheck to paycheck, unable to afford a $500 emergency. The problem is, this ain't the uh, progressive era of industrial capitalism, right? It is instead a decaying, moribund stage of fully financialized capitalism, where profits are primarily made through speculation and arbitrage by the financial bourgeoisie. Of course, surplus value is still created, commodity production is still generalized, but this gigantic shift uh, that hits a nodal point in 2008, it changes everything, right? Uh, the problem is that all of those industrial jobs are long gone, right? Uh, the unions built by those workers, they're long gone. So what happens to these people as reproletarianization hits them? They begin searching to solutions for the problem, right? Solutions to the impossibility of continuing on in the old way. And what are they greeted with? They are greeted with the middle class left of the last period of history, who unfortunately still dominate many organizations and institutions. They are greeted with the distorters and the opportunists. In a word, they're greeted by reaction dressed as revolution. I'm sure the details of how this happens are way better explained by others here. Uh, what we're focused on now and what I'm going to finish with is twofold. One, how this affects the traditional proletariat, of which there is still a, a good amount of people, and we've touched on slightly already, and how it fe affects the proletariat, which is already far more numerous, even as it's only coming into being now. And for the proletariat, since this is sort of where I come from, uh, the east side of Cleveland to be exact, sitting in the shadow of the rusted out auto plants and choking on the sulfur tinted smoke of steel mills, I'd like to tell a story from my own life or my own lived experience to use a favorite jargon of the left, right? Uh, at the Institute, we often joke that these organizations are run like HR departments, right? It's a joke that's only funny because it's true though. And there's a reason for that. The reason is it's class character. Middle classes, as Marx teaches us, can't really see out of that middle. They see themselves as above all class antagonisms, to quote them directly. The stability inherent in their position, an ability to do more than work paycheck to paycheck, this creates a lack of necessity, easing the contradiction. And it is necessity that drives the creation of class consciousness and the creation of a revolutionary agent, no matter what era we're talking about. Middle classes just ain't got that these days. And so they have the luxury of the purity fetish. They have the luxury of policing language and cannibalizing themselves to the point of inaction or even action on behalf of the ruling class. Because despite all their big talk, as Carlos pretty much proved without a doubt in his book on the subject, the purity fetish left ain't really interested in revolution. 
This leads them to a very Perdonist foundation of how they see everything, according to their own subjective views of Perdon's eternal justice, right? Which is then reinforced as they get uh, in contact with the distorters and falsifiers. And this is something that fascinates me about the way they think, right? I see this time after time, and it still amazes me. They seem to have the ability to turn every subjective view, every opinion they have into an objective fact that exists outside of themselves. I'm sure I don't have to explain the ideological issues here, but this is an integral part of how the purity fetish becomes concrete here. Just as a quick example, the last time I was on a panel like this, we talked about a brand name that had become very hip and trendy within this milieu, the term Pat Sock, which was somehow nowhere than everywhere overnight, which, by the way, is suspicious enough on its own. But this term was used by these same exact people we already know as falsifying and doctoring Marxism, and it instills national nihilism and an aversion to their own people in all of the young re-proletarians getting radical radicalized that it touches. The Marxist view of patriotism has always been the same, going way back to the beginning, as it's based in the basic Marxist analysis of what makes a people, what makes a nation, and what makes everything, really. For Marxism, there's no such thing as abstract universality or an individual liberal human subject like those who brought the brand Pat Sock around believe there is. This is pure liberalism. For Marxism, a universal is only a universal because it is taken on a particular determinate form, right? This is true of everything. Every universal is rooted in the particular. Internationalism, which is what they mistake their abstract liberalism for, is the shared material condition of each national particularity. And there is no exception to this as a shared material condition, or I'm sorry, as uh, J.B. Stalin pointed out long ago. And so for Marxism, communism, socialism, communist, socialist, all of it isn't always inherently patriotic. And so if we can track these brands and dismissals, such as Patsock, that pop up uh, right to their sources, we can find ourselves the enemy. Lenin, Stalin, Mao, they all make these statements about patriotism and the enemies of the people. Slash, well, you're, you're, you're past the, the 20 minute mark, brother. Can you mind okay. wrapping up? Yeah, no Thank problem. You. Let me let me go on to the my last uh, thing. For anyone who doesn't know me well, I've been in all types of different organizing, right? Over the years, I'm a member of the Communist Party. I'm very active in my neighborhood, my community, my shop at work. And that's only since I've gotten back into things. I'm an old man now, right? Uh, so I've been in more than a few left meetings, and I can tell you that it is only a middle-class culture that is tolerated there. And that is absolutely alienating to the proletariat. The intolerance and hyper-individualism and the social chauvinism of the middle classes, which sees itself as enlightened, looks down on everyone else as irredeemably backwards and stupid and in need of its enlightened leadership, right? I don't have to explain the purity fetish. Uh, but this is a primary expression of it. And almost all of these are run according to strictures created in corporate boardrooms. This is why it feels like a meeting with HR, because things like the progressive stack and all the privilege walk type workshops and all of it were designed by corporations and NGOs, bourgeois institutions. And they are all designed from this sort of social consciousness. What Michael Parenti used to call the anything but class or the McCarthyite left. It's the middle class inability to see class arriving in concrete form. And so it sees all manner of difference and demands deference to difference, but it cannot see what is right in front of it. That all of this difference is what unites us. Different forms of class struggle and humanity itself, really. But that's neither here nor there. I sit through these, right? I sit through these HR meetings and I deal with them because I believe we are capable of overcoming these problems. But here's the rub, because these forces refuse to embrace their own liberalism and insist on pretending they're communists. The language of communists is still present in some form. And so the working class, or really an abstract they call workers that they despise the moment it becomes concrete, really, is still there. And so as the only actual proletarian in many of these meetings, I've been asked more times than I can count. 
No, you always talk about your coworkers. You tell us how they were mostly Trump voters. And now all of them are on board for socialism. Why don't you ever bring them here? And the truth is, I can never answer this question because I can never answer it honestly. Answering them honestly will get me sent down to the head of HR so fast, it's not even funny. Because the truth is, one of the fatal flaws of the lack of necessary, necessity inherent within the remnants of the stable middle classes is an inability to address those flaws. And the truth in regards to their question is that I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed of how unserious the left has become and embarrassed of how easily fooled by distortions the people who say they want to be communists have become. If I brought any of my coworkers, all of whom did vote Trump and all of whom are now on board for socialism, because I've been able to explain to them over time what these things actually mean, they would sit there for about five minutes. Then the first time they were told about a progressive stack or the dude with the giant bushy beard was told to give his pronouns or lectured on what words they were allowed to say or any, any of this stuff uh, that makes them function like a mandatory company meeting with HR, my coworkers would get up and they would leave and I would never hear the end of it at work. Because nobody wants to deal with HR. The proletariat has necessity. There are real struggles to be considered. As I mentioned, everything is getting more expensive and our wages are getting worse. We need to worry about the bank not taking the house, about making sure the kids have food on the table. We don't even have time to worry about our own feelings, let alone to consider everyone else's and walk on eggshells the whole time around them because of their sensitivity to language. And so it is absolutely insulting to tell a working class single mother living in a trailer park that she needs to shut up and listen or check her privilege because actually she's an oppressor and she didn't even know it. So she should probably decolonize her mind because her great grandparents emigrated from Ireland, then lived in ghettos and worked in the same crappy jobs all immigrants work their whole lives. And just that whole thing rubs me the wrong way. But this is the necessity of the, re of the proletariat. When we combine this with the reproletariat entering the picture, it brings up a question. I was going to try to answer that, but I'm out of time. So thank you all so very much for putting up with my rambling. Thank you, Noah. Um, important uh, perspective. Um, our next speaker is Gabriel Rockhill. Gabriel is a philosopher, cultural critic, and activist. He is the founding director of the Critical Theory Workshop and professor of philosophy at Villanova University. He has published nine books, as well as numerous scholarly and journalistic articles, including most recently, Counter History of the Present, uh, Interventions in Contemporary Thought, Radical History, and the Politics of Art. And uh, for more information, you can follow him at GabrielRockhill.com. Thank you so much for, for joining us, Gabriel. You can start your presentation. Thank you, Carlos. And thanks to all of the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a <clears throat> brief 15-minute presentation entitled The Imperial Bourgeoisie. And um, I'd like to begin by just uh, highlighting the fact that there is very little reflection, I think, on the part of the PMC stratum regarding its class standing. And that there's often a deep-seated skepticism that Noah was talking about uh, on the part of the working class regarding certain segments of the PMC. And this can often lead to certain forms of counterproductive anti-intellectualism. In my opinion, there needs to be more, much more self-critical analysis of class standing, as well as a broader awareness of the role of cross-class alliances in advancing the socialist cause. Uh, personally, I'm not speaking from the point of view of someone who's unfamiliar with the working world. I'm currently a university professor and would be classified as a member of the PMC stratum within the Imperial Corps, and I think that's important to highlight. At the same time, I grew up on a farm in rural Kansas doing farm labor and working construction, and then I continued to support myself throughout my studies by continuing to work uh, construction. And so I share this information simply because uh, in order to indicate the fact that the things that I'll be talking about are not somehow, uh, you know, uh, external to my own uh, experience. And I'm deeply familiar with the life of manual labor, as well as the forms of intellectual labor uh, undertaken by the PMC. So the professional intellectuals in the Imperial Corps are generally disconnected from the struggles of working people. While this is commonly the case on the domestic front, they're even more detached from the international working class in the global south. 
unsurprisingly, then, they often take political positions that are detrimental to the working and oppressed masses of the world. The phenomenon known as Western Marxism is an excellent example, as are the various forms of Western radical or critical theory. While sometimes advancing pertinent critiques of capitalism, and in particular of subjective experiences within consumer society, these traditions have more or less systematically advocated for ABS theory, anything but socialism. They've rejected every type of socialism in the real world, unless, of course, it is a form of so-called democratic socialism that is not a serious threat to capitalism, but rather a class compromise. This means that they advocate for a BS theory because they refuse to embrace the real material solution to the problems of capitalism, which is the difficult but necessary construction of socialism. This situation has led to an understandable skepticism on the part of many workers regarding any possible positive contribution by the professional intelligentsia, or at least those ensconced within the academy, since there is often a remarkable amount of faith placed in other segments of the intelligentsia, such as journalists and pundits interviewed in the mainstream media. In a country like the United States, such skepticism, though partially justifiable, is enhanced by the deep-seated anti-intellectualism that plagues the country's culture. For those invested in a meaningful transformation of society in an egalitarian and sustainable direction, this skepticism has often led to ultra-leftist positions that consist in maintaining that workers can and should make a revolution on their own without the pernicious influence of professional intellectuals. In many organizing circles, including political parties, this anti-intellectualism often goes hand in hand with a form of populism that fetishizes the spontaneous thoughts and actions of workers. Such a position, I will argue, is dangerous and counterproductive. In what is to be done, Lenin clearly stated that bourgeois theorists are not only helpful to making a revolution insofar as they are capable of providing a theoretical map of the social totality and how to transform it, they are actually necessary for revolution, and it is naive and short-sighted to rely on spontaneous workers' consciousness. Quote, this is from Lenin's What is to be Done. All those who talk about exaggerating the importance of ideology, about exaggerating the role of the conscious elements, etc., imagine that the pure and simple labor movement can work out an independent ideology for itself if only the workers take their fate out of the hands of the leaders. This, Lenin says, is a profound mistake, end quote. The peerless leader of the Russian Revolution thereby took a categorical position that cuts directly against the grain of the ultra-leftist celebration of autonomous and spontaneous worker struggles as capable of leading directly to socialist revolution, as well as against the widespread anti-intellectualism that plagues a country like the U.S. There are many reasons for Lenin taking this position, but I'd like to simply highlight two. The first is that he insightfully elucidated why the spontaneous consciousness of workers tends to be trade unionism, insofar as they gravitate toward political positions that serve their personal economic interests, such as increases in wages, shorter work weeks, more benefits, and so forth. Moreover, within the imperial core, workers have often engaged in social chauvinism by ignoring the plight of workers in the colonial and semi-colonial periphery while aligning themselves on the interests of their national bourgeoisies. This means that spontaneous workers' consciousness tends to remain within bourgeois ideology, insofar as they are trained within the capitalist system to look out for their own material interests and to preserve their position atop the imperial pyramid. Second, Lenin maintained that the power of Marxist theory consists, among other things, in the ability to move from the level of subjective experience to an objective analysis of the social totality. It is capable of explaining why the subjective ideology of workers is the result of objective social forces, if it be the subjectivism that pervades capitalist ideology or the social chauvinism that results from imperialist socioeconomic relations. It can, in other words, concretely abstract from the immediacy of personal experience in order to elucidate the system of relations that produces that experience in the first place. Since, since spontaneous thought and action within capitalism are necessarily subordinated to bourgeois ideology, this form of objective analysis that you get in Marxist theory can contribute to the development of socialist ideology. This, very precisely, is the role of the bourgeois intelligentsia, according to Lenin. And he cites Kautsky and uses the term bourgeois intelligentsia. 
on the basis of profound scientific knowledge, it produces the ideology of socialism, which does not naturally or organically arise within the working class. Now, this does not mean, as Lenin clarifies in a very important footnote, that, quote, the workers have no part in creating such an ideology, end quote. But they do so not as workers, but as socialist theoreticians who are capable of acquiring the knowledge of their age and advancing that knowledge. Um, I'd like to shift now to the question of the imperial petty bourgeoisie and the intellectual labor aristocracy. So the PMC stratum in the imperial core is not only situated above the working class domestically, it is also positioned at the apex of an international pyramid, both economically and ideologically. In the case of professional intellectuals, those intellectuals beneath them domestically or in the imperial pyramid are generally obliged to subordinate themselves to their dictates. There is thus an intellectual labor aristocracy, just like there is a manual labor aristocracy, although the former is elevated both economically and ideologically. So the intellectual labor aristocracy serves as global power brokers in the realm of ideas. To take a recent example, major figures in the tradition of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, which has been a core contributor to the legacy of Western Marxism, have taken strong public positions on the question of Palestine. Jürgen Habermas and Rainer Forst co-authored with others a text entitled Principles of Sovereignty, in which they wrote, quote, despite all the concern for the fate of the Palestinian population, the standards of judgment slip completely when genocidal intentions are attributed to Israel's actions, end quote. In perfect line with the dominant ideology in the imperial core, they suggest that attributing genocidal intentions to the Israeli government would inexorably lead to anti-Semitism, as if the anti-imperialist critique of the state of Israel could only be understood through a culturalist lens as a condemnation of all Jewish people. This anti-Marxist, culturalist form of identitarian thinking means in short that there simply is no space for an anti-imperialist critique of the Israeli state. It is foreclosed as anti-Semitic. Moreover, the authors uh, Habermas and Forst leave out of their discussion the patent fact that many members of the Israeli leadership have clearly and repeatedly stated their genocidal intentions and their words have been fully backed up by their deeds. At this point, at least 17,000 Palestinians have been killed since October 7th and about 1.9 million have been displaced according to the UN. To put this in perspective, these numbers now surpass the 1948 Nakba when some 15,000 people were killed and 800,000 displaced. Shayla Ben-Habib, a political science professor at Yale University, has taken a very similar position. I'm going to jump over this material in the interest of time, but she basically says that we can't look at the conflict in Palestine uniquely through a settler colonial lens and plays the petty bourgeois card of it's more complicated, meaning it's more complicated than imperialism. And there's an excellent article by uh, Muhammad Ali Khalidi that uh, goes after her on this front and also points out a number of the disingenuous mischaracterizations that are in her article. So when world famous professional intellectuals like Shayla ben Habib, Jürgen Habermas and others of their ilk reprimand those critical of Israel's settler colonial project and recent genocidal assault made possible of course by imperialist countries that support Israel and especially the United States, they are exercising their power as members of the intellectual labor aristocracy to discipline those beneath them, both within their respective countries and internationally. They are also seeking to corral and control public opinion by exercising their so-called expertise, which is itself a product of the imperial intellectual apparatus that forged them as intellectuals. When they parrot the fundamental core of the dominant ideology of the US State Department, they are quite literally doing their job as imperialist ideologues who are perched atop an international hierarchy of knowledge production for a reason. So the petty bourgeois class stratum is itself notoriously unreliable and unstable. It works for and is subservient to the capitalist ruling class and it generally promotes the dominant ideology as I've just demonstrated briefly with the examples I highlighted. However, bereft of the power of its corporate overlords and beholden to their decisions, it often expresses resentment and frustration, and it sometimes presents itself as being on the side of the masses. One of the most common orientations of this latter group, those who feign to be on the side of workers, um, is petty bourgeois radicalism. 
It consists in proposing magical solutions to very real problems. This can take very different forms, but one of the most common is third-way politics that identifies the pernicious effects of capitalism, but condemns the long and difficult road to building socialism through political parties and the seizure of state power. Instead, it proffers a quote-unquote left critique of actually existing socialism and advocates for an alternative path to overcoming capitalism, the magical third way. This form of politics can take the uh, take various different forms, such as the support for an insurgent disruption of the given order by spontaneous action, the immediate establishment of a direct workers' democracy, or the messianic postulation of a transcendent idea of communism to come. Whatever the case may be, these third-way proposals serve the purpose of radical recuperation. They sound radical due to their critiques of capitalism. However, since their proposed solutions are based on magical thinking, their radicality has no basis in material reality and concrete class struggles. Therefore, they actually serve to recuperate potentially radical forces within a process of capitalist accommodation. In the words of Gus Hall, quote, petty bourgeois radicalism does a very special favor to capitalism because it covers its anti-communism and anti-Sovietism with left radical phrases, end quote. Since it does not materially and concretely contribute to workers' struggles, but instead shores up the capitalist system, petty bourgeois radicalism serves first and foremost to consolidate the socioeconomic position of the professional intelligentsia within capitalism. As a form of class struggle, it struggles to maintain the class position of the professional managerial class strata. Final concluding section is on the contradiction of intellectual life under capitalism. So to develop theory, which is a necessity, as I mentioned earlier, according to Lenin, to make a socialist revolution, you need education, support, resources, time, and so on. Within capitalism, this tends to be possible primarily within the imperial intellectual apparatus, although there are, of course, some exceptions. In order to advance within that apparatus, meaning this whole system for the production of ideas, their distribution, and their consumption, you have to play by the rules of the game, at least to a certain extent. An entire system of norms and values must be respected if you want to ascend within the extant social order. These pressures and others uh, and other forces tend to breed conformism. After all, the surest way to succeed in the imperial intellectual apparatus is to invest in an imperialist theoretical practice like Jürgen Habermas and Sheila Benabib, whose fame in the system is itself indicative of their political orientation. I would like to conclude then by indicating two tactics and one overall strategy for dealing with the following contradiction. Intellectuals are capable of providing forms of objective analysis that are necessary to revolutionary transformation of society, but within the imperial intellectual apparatus, they're trained instead to contribute to imperialism and their career advancement largely depends on the extent of their contribution as mediated as this contribution might be. The first tactic might be referred to as Trojan horse intellectual labor. It consists in producing the appearance of work that is palatable to the extant system in some capacity, but that actually smuggles in an alternative message or does underground anonymous work. The advantage of this tactic is that it is feasible within the given system of knowledge production, and it leverages power for those who can benefit from the time, resources, and training of the capitalist system of knowledge production. The disadvantage is that it often requires extensive sacrifices and compromises and can easily remain somewhat precarious. The second tactic, and I'm gonna finish here in two, three minutes, Carlos. The second tactic consists in cultivating worker intellectuals who have greater freedom to do counter hegemonic uh, theoretical research because their livelihood is not dependent upon the imperial intellectual apparatus or because they work anonymously. One of the clearest examples in the current context is the work of Norman Finkelstein um, and everything that he's been doing around the most recent genocidal assault against the Palestinians. He's saying things and taking positions that are directly opposed to those of Habermas and Ben Habib. If he had an academic job, he could easily lose it. However, since he was already the object of a heinous campaign that left him bereft of an academic position, this simply is not possible. There are many other examples that could be pointed to, uh, including, of course, the work of intellectuals who never had stable university positions, like Michael Parenti, as well as those who never taught in the academy at all, such as George Jackson. It is important in this regard that counter-hegemonic intellectual work 
often goes hand in hand with the development of an alternative apparatus of knowledge production, circulation, and reception. Such an apparatus seeks to put power in the hands of the people rather than the ownership class, thereby democratizing intellectual labor and learning. I take it that all of the three organizations that have co-sponsored this event are, in different ways, with various objectives, and with very limited resources, attempting to do something along these lines. The more resources that can be leveraged in this direction, the more opportunities there will be to support the work of intellectual workers who are not ensconced in the bourgeois academy. Final words, both of these tactics can put intellectuals in the service of the socialist cause. However, the overall strategy needs to be the building of a socialist intellectual apparatus in which the educational system functions of, by, and for the people. This is not an easy task, and the establishment of a socialist country does not magically bring this about. Struggles continue after revolutions, of course, to further develop, perfect, and democratize systems of intellectual production, circulation, and reception. This can be a very long and difficult process, but it must remain the horizon of our work. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Um, since I'm doing the moderating, I, I'll om omit the, introduce, the introduction of myself since I, I, I did that at the beginning. But I think the, the way you end your presentation is a really nice uh, segue into some of the themes that I want to touch on. Um, the question we are exploring today concerning the divorce of intellectuals in the working class is fundamental for assessing the crisis we face and the subjective conditions for revolution. The first thing I think must be interrogated is what is presupposed in the formulation of the problem in such manner. When we say that there has been a split, a schism, between intellectuals and the working class, there is a specific type of intellectual that we have in mind. The grand majority of intellectuals, especially within the capitalist mode of life, have had their lots tied to the dominant social system. They have functioned as a necessary component of the dominant order. Those who take the ideals of the bourgeoisie, the class enemy of most of humanity, and embellish them in language which opens the narrow interests of the ruling class to the contenting approval of contending classes. In the same manner Marx describes the bourgeoisie as the personified agents of capital, the intellectuals have been the personified agents of capitalist ideology. They are tasked, as Gramsci taught us, with making the dispersed and unpopular bourgeois assumptions into a coherent and appealing outlook. One people are socialized into accepting as reality itself. Intellectuals have always, in a certain sense, been those groups of people that light the fire and move the statues, which the slaves in the cave see as cave shadows embodying reality itself. These intellectuals, the traditional intellectuals, are of course not the ones we have in mind when we speak of a schism between intellectuals and workers. We are speaking, instead, of those who have been historically able to see the movement of history, to make splits within bourgeois worldviews, and who have subsequently thrown their lots in with the proletariat and popular classes, those forces which present the kernel for the next, more human, more democratic mode of life. Marx and Engels had already noted that there is always a section of bourgeois ideologists that raise themselves to the level of comprehending theoretically the historical movement as a whole, and set themselves adrift to join the revolutionary class, the class that holds the future in its hands. We're talking about the Du Boises, the Apthikers, the Marinelos, in the case of Cuba, the Parentes, and others who, while coming out of the institutions of the bourgeois academy, would align their interests with working and oppressed peoples. They would become the theoreticians, the historians, the poets, which gave the working class movements uh, various forms of clarity in their struggles for power. What has happened to this section of intellectuals and its relationship with working people? Have they lost their thirst for freedom? Have, has their capacity for trembling with indignation, as Che would say, at the injustices waged on working and oppressed people suddenly dissipated? It is important to note that any attempt to answer this question in this short time span will always, by necessity, leave important aspects of the conversation out. I would love here to speak at length about the campaigns of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, the formation of a fake anti-communist left, and the role imperialist state departments, bourgeois foundations, and other such outfits had in creating a left intelligentsia divorced from the real movements of working people, both within the imperial core and in the periphery. I know my colleagues here uh, have been paying much more uh, due attention to these monumental components of answering the question we have before us. However, I'd like to instead focus on the practice of intellectuals, on the expectations and requirements set by the academy itself, 
which have already baked into its very structure the divorce of radical intellectuals from the struggles and movements of working and oppressed peoples. The first thing that must be noted is the following. We cannot simply treat this problem as one rooted in the intellectuals as a class, nor as one rooted in the subjective deficiencies of, popular, of, of particular intellectuals. The Marxist worldview requires us to examine the system, the social totality that produces such a split. We are tasked with exploring the political economy of knowledge production, if you will, which structures the relations of its mental workers through forms which insularize them to the structures and needs of the academy. As Gabriel Rockhill would say, it is a political economy of knowledge that systematically reproduces radical recuperators, compatible lefts, and pseudo-radical purity fetish outlooks that play an indispensable role in the reproduction of our moribund capitalist imperialist system. From the moment prospective radical scholars enter graduate school, they are integrated into this system. Their lofty hopes of being active participants as intellectuals in a class struggle are castrated by the demands the academy makes upon them qua scholars. They're told that their writing should take a distinctively academic tone, that popular vernacular is frowned upon, that hyper-referentiality, the practice of citing all the intellectual gods in the cosmos who have commented on a topic, is a good sign, is a sign of good work and of proper scholarship. Truth and the struggle for human freedom are at best given a back seat, and that is if they're in the vehicle at all. Young scholars in the incubators of their careers are already indoctrinated in the aristocratic dogmas of writing for a select group of elite scholars, worshiping journal impact factors, and condescendingly dismissing those who use their intellectual capacities to work for the people, actually in proper Socratic fashion, engage in the radical quest for truth. Those who seek to uh, properly understand the world in order to work with the masses of humanity to change it. Young scholars, burdened by tens of thousands of dollars accumulated in undergraduate studies debts, are told that even with a PhD, they will have an extremely difficult time finding a job, at least one suitable for continued academic work that pays sufficiently enough to pay back the accumulated debt. They are told, specifically those with radical sensibilities, that they should focus on joining academic associations, network with people in their fields, familiarize themselves with the work published in leading journals so that they too, one day, can join the publication Hamster Wheel aimed at advancing these slaves through the 10-year ladder. They are told that they must not waste their time writing for popular audiences, that doing broadcasts and media work that reaches infinitely more people than the readers of ridiculously paywalled journals or university editorials is a waste of time. Every attempt at rooting their scholarship in the people in the real movements of our day is shot down. The gurus mediating their initiation into the academic capitalist cult ask, do you know uh, Do you know how this sort of work will look on your resume to the hiring committees? Do you think scholars in charge of your tenure advancement will appreciate your popular articles for countercurrents, your books from monthly review, your articles in low impact factor or impact factor less journals? At every turn, your attempts to commit yourself to the Socratic pursuit of truth, to playing a role in changing the world is condemned as sinful to the gods of resume evaluation. They say, do you not want to finish your degree with the potential of gaining, uh, of, uh, of obtaining gainful employment? Do you want to be condemned to adjunct professorialship, professorialship, to teaching seven classes for half the pay of the full professors who teach three? Do you want to condemn your family to debt slavery for the decades to come simply because you did not want to join our very special and elite uh, uh, publication hamster wheel? After all, you wouldn't want to spend months writing an article to send it into a journal that will reply in a year telling you, if you're amongst the lucky ones, that it has been accepted with revisions rooted in the specific biases of the arbitrary reviewers. Does that sound fun? Isn't this what philosophy and the humanities in general is all about? Eventually, material pressures themselves break the spirit of young visionary scholars. Reproletarianized and unable to survive on teaching assistantships, they resign themselves to the hamster wheel with hopes of one day living the comfortable lives of their professors. Their radical sensibilities, however, are still there. They need an outlet. They look around and find that the academic hamster wheel has pockets of radicals writing edgy things for decently rated journals. They quickly find their kin, those who reduce radical politics to social transgressiveness, those who are concerned more with dissecting concepts like epistemic violence than with the violence of imperialism. Here it is, the young scholar thinks, a place where I can pad my resume and absolve myself of the guilt weighing down on my shoulders, a guilt rooted in the recognition deep down that one has betrayed the struggles for humanity, that one has become an agent of the forces they originally desired to fight against. Their existence, their lives, will always be rooted in what Sartre called bad faith, 
Self-deception becomes their norm. They are now the radical ones, the enlightened ones in issues of language. The working class has become a backwards rabble they must educate, and that if they come near them at all. What, what hope could there be in this group of deplorables? Sure, American capitalism could be criticized, but at least we're enlightened. We're woke to LGBTQ issues and other issues. But those Russians, Chinese, Venezuelans, Iranians, et cetera, et cetera, aren't they backwards? What are their thoughts on trans issues? Should we not, in the interest of our enlightened civilization, support our government's efforts to civilize them? Let's go take them some of our valued democracy and human rights. I'm sure their people will appreciate it very much. I have presented the stories which are all too familiar uh, to those of us still working within the academy. It is evident, in my view at least, that the divorce of radical intellectuals from working class people and their movements has been an institutionalized effort of the capitalist elite. This division is embedded, it is implied in the process of intellectuals becoming what the system requires of them for their own survival. They re the relations they occupy in the process of knowledge production presupposes their split with working people. This rigidity of academic life has intensified over the last century. Yes, we do have plenty of past cases of radical academics, those who have sided with the people, being kicked to the curb by their academic institutions. But where have they landed and why? Doesn't a blackballed Du Bois get to teach at the Communist Party's Jefferson School? Doesn't Herbert Aptheker, following his expulsion from the academy, obtain a position as the full-time editor-in-chief of the Communist Party's theoretical journal, Political Affairs? Besides the aforementioned, what other factors make our day different from, say, 1950s U.S.? The answer is simple. What counter-hegemonic popular institutions we had were destroyed, in part by the efforts of our government, in part by the collapse or the overthrow of the Soviet bloc. Although some, like ourselves, are currently in the process of attempting to construct them, today we have nowhere near the material and financial conditions we had in the past. The funding and aid the Soviets provided American communists is, unfortunately, not something provided for us by the dominant socialist states of our era. Ideology does not exist in a transcendental realm. It is embodied materially through people and institutions. Without the institutions that can ensure that radical scholars are not forced to tiptoe the line of the bourgeois academy, the material conditions for this split will be sustained. If I may, I would like to end with the following point. It is very easy to condemn the so-called radical academics we find in the bourgeois hamster wheel divorced from the people and their struggles. While condemnation might sometimes be justified, I think pity is the correct reaction. They are subjects of a tragedy. As Hegel notes, the essence of tragedy is found in the contradictions at play between the various roles an individual occupies. Sophocles' Antigone is perhaps the best example. Here, a sister, Antigone, is torn between the duty she has to bury her brother, Polynices, and the duty she has as a citizen to follow King Creon's decry, which considers Polynices a traitor undeserving of a formal barrier. This contradiction is depicted nicely in Hegel's work, who says that both are in the wrong because they are one-sided, but both are also in the right. Our so-called radical intelligentsia is, likewise, caught in the contradiction of the two roles they wish to occupy, one as revolutionary and the other as academic. Within the confines of the existing institutions, there can be no consistent reconciliation of the duties implied in each role. This is the setup of a classical tragedy, one which takes various forms with each individual scholar. It is also, as Socrates reminds uh, Aristophanes and Agathon at the end of Plato's Symposium, a comedy, since the true artist in tragedy is an artist in comedy also. The tragic and simultaneous comedic position occupied by the radical intelligentsia can only be overcome with the development of popular counter-hegemonic institutions, such as parties and educational institutes akin to those sponsoring today's panel. It is only here where scholars can embed themselves in the people. However, scholars are humans living under capitalism. They need, just like everyone else, to have the capacity to pay for their basic subsistence. These institutions, therefore, must work to develop the capacity of financially supporting both the intellectual traders to the traditional bourgeois academy and the organic intellectuals emerging from the working class itself. That is, I think, one of the central tasks facing those attempting to bridge the divide, divide we have convened to examine today. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's all for my presentation. Um, the next uh, presenter is Radhika Desai, uh, who is a professor at the Department of Political Science, uh, of Political Studies, excuse me. She is director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group at the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, Canada. She is the uh, convener of the International Manifesto Group, 
Her books include Capitalism, Coronavirus, and War, A Geopolitical Economy, which I have just back there. It's an excellent book. Uh, Geopolitical Economy, After U.S. Hegemony, Globalization, and Empire from 2013, Slouching Towards uh, Ayodhya, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, From Congress to Hindutva in Indian Politics, and Intellectuals in Socialism, Social Democrats and the Labor Party from 1994, uh, A New Statesman and Society Book of the Month. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Radhika, and you may uh, begin your presentation. Hi, everyone. The title that I've given to uh, my presentation is Intellectuals and Socialism, an End and a Beginning. Um, and I just want to say as a preface that I'm speaking from a long history of having written and thought about uh, the whole question of how intellectuals engage with political life. So my I cut my political teeth writing about um, the relationship between the between the think tanks that had sort of cropped up in the 70s and even earlier and the way in which they contributed to Thatcherism. And then I later on, when that was my MA thesis, I then went on to write uh, a PhD thesis uh, on um, titled Intellectuals and Socialism on the British Labour Party. And since then, I've continued to think about this topic simply because I continue to work on Marxism in particular and reflect on how not only what a powerful uh, critique of capitalism it is, which then makes you think about where it comes from and why it is so powerful in terms of its the structure of its thinking and so on, but also the particular ways in which it has become denatured in the last little while. It's almost as though with the onset of neoliberalism, we had uh, certain repercussions of that, certain reflections of that in intellectual life and particularly in the nexus between intellectual and political life. So, uh, the, and, and of course I should add that uh, since this is an international manifesto group webinar, that of course in writing about the manifesto, those of us who were involved in drafting it were also thinking a great deal about this theme. So that's roughly where I come from. So what I want to do today is, uh, oh, and I should also add that I speak from some other experiences. I've long been interested in the whole understanding of ideology and how it relates to the material life, which is, of course, a standard Marxist perspective. I find that talking about intellectual life and culture without looking at the material structure and foundations of it is simply useless. It is worse than useless. I also have a background in India. I grew up in a time when the dirigiste uh, development model was beginning to unravel. But at the same time, it was very clear that some of the most interesting and important ideas about India's development had come from the left. And of course, the uh, since the adoption of right-wing ideas, India's development has gone, uh, uh, gone, uh, it's not been as good, basically. Um, and of course, this has also led me to work on how the ideology of nationalism has changed between the developmental or dirigist period and the neoliberal period. So, so there are a lot of the things that are going into this, but I should also caution that nothing I say here is very definitive. There is much more thinking to be done on the subject, which is why I'm, of course, so enthusiastic about this panel. And I'm so honored to be joined by such powerful thinkers who have already spoken before me. So in outline, what I want to do is I want to uh, basically uh, tell you a little bit about um, the way in which I think about uh, the intellectual function in political life with the help of Gramsci. And here, of course, most people know a lot, lot about Gramsci, but I'm also going to point to certain um, unexpected parts of, of Gramsci. And then I want to talk about what really happened in the 1970s, because I see that as being a, a being essentially the, 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 uh, 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 the nexus or the turning point at which the structure of intellectual life and its relationship to politics, that, that whole structure changed quite radically. So when we had the shift from essentially Keynesian welfare state thinking to neoliberal thinking as the dominant thinking, we also witnessed a major change in the structure of the relationship between intellectuals and political life. And then I want to say something about the political repercussions of it and maybe a few things about where we might be at today, which will, of course, be the most tentative. So this is the part on which I'm going to spend most time. Most of you know that Gramsci spent a lot of time talking about 
hegemony and ideology and the relation and, and essentially the whole cultural aspect of political life. But I think what's less widely appreciated is that this was very deeply bound up with his attempt to understand the structure and evolution of intellectual life in capitalist societies generally and also of course in the case of his native Italy. So he was a he, he sort of mapped this very, very well. And out of this preoccupation came a, a certain way of thinking about the role of intellectuals in politics. So in, so first of all, let me just say that the the category of intellectuals was central to Gramsci's conception of hegemony, uh, counter hegemony, the hegemonic contestation, and therefore, of course, political change. So here is a quote from his prison notebooks, where he says the exploration and refinement, or, sorry, this is a quote as I quoted in one of my publications. But anyway, the exploration and refinement of the concept of the unity of theory and practice is still only at an early stage. So, you know, he's clearly connecting with, with Marx's whole notion of praxis as the unity of theory and practice. People speak about theory as a complement or accessory to practice or as a handmaid of practice. It would seem right for this question too to be considered historically as an aspect of the political question of intellectuals. Critical self-consciousness means historically and politically the creation of an elite of intellectuals. And Gramsci is very clear on this point. He discusses this at various other places as well, is that on the one hand, he calls them an elite. That is to say that everybody is not going to be an intellectual. Everybody is an intellectual in the sense that everybody thinks, but there are relatively few people who have the social function of thinking for the rest of society while others are engaged in other things. So it involves the creation, as he says, of an elite of intellectuals. The human mass, he says, does not distinguish itself, does not become independent in its own right without, in the widest sense, organizing itself. And there is no organization without intellectuals. Uh, that is without organizers and leaders, the people who do the thinking for the organization. Um, in other words, without the theoretical aspect of the theory practice nexus being distinguished concretely by the existence of a group of people specialized in conceptual and philosophical elaboration of ideas. And I must emphasize once more that Gramsci nowhere uh, uh, is speaking from a point of view which says, you know, the masses are stupid or anything. He is making a completely sociological distinction, a distinction between those who may be even brighter than those who may be intellectuals, but are engaged in other things. They are, do not have the time to think about uh, politics about what's going on, philosophy, etc., and those who are charged with doing so. Those charged with doing so can do a great job, but they can also do a terrible job. Then he, within this uh, understanding of the centrality of intellectuals, he, dis he introduces two interrelated concepts, that of traditional intellectuals and organic intellectuals. So let's take a look at these concepts. So what are traditional intellectuals? Gramsci says the following, in capitalist societies, the intellectuals under the label traditional include the noblesse de robe, a stratum of administrators, scholars and scientists, non-ecclesiastical philosophers, etc., who have replaced the ecclesiastical intellectuals of feudal society as secular organizers of culture in modern capitalist society. The traditional intellectuals lacked the organic intellectuals' rootedness in the latent aspiration and the development of real forms of life. So we are anticipating here a bit, but basically he sees organic intellectuals as coming from the social base of which they, uh, uh, whose aspirations, whose needs they represent and they develop intellectually. So the traditional intellectuals do not have that sort of rootedness in a specific part of society. 
if this deracination inflected their role with a certain abstracted elitism and idealism in contrast to the initially partial and specialized character of organic intellectuals, these independent intellectuals elaborated universal visions of order. So now he's introducing another really important thing. He says that spontaneously, those who are more rooted may also be producing, in fact, they are likely to be producing initially initially partial and specialized worldviews. So if you are a, a, an organic intellectual of the working class, then you will speak more, in a, essentially have a vision that may not be as encompassing. You may voice the concerns of working class people, or if you're an intellectual of the petty bourgeois class, the same. But he says that the traditional intellectuals, because they are not rooted in any part of society, they are independent, have historically elaborated universal visions of social order. So that's traditional intellectuals. What about organic intellectuals? And I would say that I also think that the idea of traditional intellectuals is more historical in the sense that Gramsci is simply pointing to the uh, uh, traditional intellectuals as they have existed originally, sort of clerical or ecclesiastical, as he calls them, and later secular. And these are observations, historical observations. But his idea of organic intellectuals is in part, of course, a historical observation, but in another part, it's a program. He says that we need these sorts of people to develop, to essentially represent, especially working people. He says, the bourgeoisie have organic intellectuals of their own, no problem. The working class needs to develop their own on of, as well. So let's take a look at what Gramsci says. He says, uh, this is a, the most standard definition of organic intellectuals. Gramsci says, every social group, on coming into existence on the original terrain of an essential function in the world of economic production, so he's clearly relating it to classes, creates together with itself organically one or more strata of intellectuals which give it homogeneity and an awareness of its own function, not only in the economic, but also in the social and political fields. The capitalist entrepreneur creates alongside himself the industrial technician, the specialist in political economy, the organizers of a new culture, of a new legal system, etc. So here you see what they are saying. First of all, organic intellectuals are connected to a class. Each class creates its own set of intellectuals. And, and this is also very important, the function of intellectuals um, is, uh, uh, you know, apart from sort of creating wider legitimacy, which is how we generally see it for that particular class and its project, intellectuals also give each class homogeneity and an awareness of its own function, not only in the economic, but also in the social and political fields. So in the function of intellectuals is actually to give a program to the class that they represent. So that's very important. And then he says, of course, that capitalists, of course, uh, uh, in the normal functioning and the normal performance of their role as a capitalist will naturally produce the industrial technicians, the specialists in political economy, the sort of the new persuaders, the organizers of culture, new lawyers, etc., who will essentially express their needs, their aspirations, etc., and of course give them a, a sense of what they are to do in the law, in industry, in political economy, etc. Not only does Gramsci say uh, not say what the work, working class creates, so here he's essentially saying that the spontaneous production of intellectuals occurs in the capitalist class. He doesn't say, now we can, of course, imagine that the working class produces organizers of trade unions, et cetera, et cetera, which is all very good, even perhaps working class political parties. But let us look at what he does say. He says, initially, at least, these organic intellectuals of the working class are, for the most part, specializations of partial aspects of the primitive activity of the new social type, which the new social class brought into prominence. Sorry, not just of the working class, but of all classes. So initially, the when they originally emerge, organic intellectuals like the industrial technician or the specialist in political economy or the trade union organizer, 
Um, they represent for the most part specializations of partial aspects of the primitive activity of the new social type, that is of the class, of the capitalist class, the working class, etc. And he further says that organic intellectuals, while distinctive in that they participate in the technical labor process uh, on both sides, uh, capital and labor, must also become capable of articulating wider concerns, political and directive, from technique as work, one proceeds to technique as science, and to the humanist conception of history without which one remains specialized and does not become directive, which is specialized as well as political. So organic intellectuals, he says, must participate in the labor process, but also eventually come to the point of essentially expressing the kind of overarching worldviews, visions of social order, etc., which has hitherto been the preserve of traditional intellectuals, but they should rest from the traditional intellectuals, this task, and express fully elaborated visions of the world of the social order based on the interests of the class that they represent. Now, obviously, intellectuals of the capitalist class will express a certain type of world order, but intellectuals of the working class must express uh, the uh, the kind of the, the a worldview based on the kind of society that would be most beneficial, the most progressive from the point of view of the working class. But this requirement of going from being specialized to being universal to being directive and political has made it very difficult for working class parties and movements to be led by working class intellectuals because it is. Gramsci also says that another point, which is that it is more, it's easier because the capitalist class is organizing the whole of society because it is the ruling class. It is easier for intellectuals, the capitalist class, to make this transition from, uh, 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 from, uh, uh, from uh, 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 specialized to being uh, directive and political than it is for working class intellectuals to do the same. Um, indeed, he says that. Uh, uh, not only must working class int organic intellectuals accomplish the far more difficult task of becoming specialized and directive, but as they do so, they also have another task, which is they must, they must hegemonize, they must uh, conquer the traditional intellectuals. He says traditional intellectuals with their participation in the tradition of systemic intellectual activity also figure centrally in any struggle for hegemony. In that any group, he says, any group that is developing towards dominance, that is say a working class struggling to become the ruling class of, a, of any society, any group that is developing towards dominance struggles to assimilate and conquer the traditional intellectuals ideologically. Competing visions of social order had to be overcome in any struggle for hegemony. Um, uh, 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 for Gramsci, it would be true to say a socialist worldview, while it must ideally become organically attached and committed to the culture of the working class, is also a critical development of the existing intellectual culture. So this is from this is a combination of me and Gramsci here. So that's what organic intellectuals are. So essentially, uh, from there, Gramsci uh, also points out that essentially traditional intellectuals have been quite ubiquitous in working class politics. In fact, I would say that looking at both Gramsci and other studies of the relationship between intellectuals and working class parties in Europe from the uh, mid 19th century onwards, uh, shows that in working class politics from Marx and Engels uh, uh, onwards up to the crisis of that entire cycle of working class politics in the 1970s, traditional intellectuals have tended to be ubiquitous. It's not that there have not been organic intellectuals, but on the whole, traditional intellectuals have been the leading element. Um, and the climax of this sort of 100 year cycle, 100 plus year cycle in socialist politics that reached a crisis in the 1970s was also the climax of the traditional role or, or of the role of traditional intellectuals in the capitalist world. And I won't go very much over this, but in my um, uh, book, or Intellectuals and the Labour Party, I argue that um, the social democratic intellectuals that split from the Labour Party in 1981 represented the exhaustion of the, the historic connection between the critical sections of intellectuals in British society 
and the Labour Party. Now, I say critical, of course, but you have to remember that these were also exactly the intellectuals who made the Labour Party much more reformist than it was originally going to be. They were also responsible for the Atlanticism of the Labour Party, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But ne nevertheless, what I emphasize is that this was the only significant a group of intellectuals to try to lead the Labour Party in any kind of coherent direction. So I won't go over this, but you can stop and read this, uh, stop the video and read this if you want. Okay, so uh, uh, as I say, that role that they played, because these were traditional intellectuals and because of other wider determinants of the political situation, they de-radicalized de socialism, they reconciled it with imperialism. And of course, this uh, kind of political conjuncture also had wider effects so that even further to the left of the social democratic intellectuals of the Labour Party, we find Western Marxism has made broadly similar kinds of of um, uh, uh, kinds of compromises. Uh, uh, Perry Anderson, in his famous study, of course, pointed out that Western Marxism was a product of defeat and of counter-revolution. And that is definitely true. And Western Marxism itself, as I will speak, uh, speak about in the next slide, has itself been responsible for a major de-radicalization of Marxism itself. So let's look at what happened in the 1970s. Essentially, what you began to see already by this time, and this, of course, the 1970s is not just the shift from the Keynesian welfare state to neoliberalism, but also a whole bunch of other things that are happening, including the so-called cultural turn, the increasing dominance of postmodernism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So essentially, you begin to see the marginalization and decline of traditional intellectuals. So you see, for example, that uh, for in the case of, say, Thatcherism, you find that um, all sorts of uh, university-based economists were quite opposed to Thatcherism. And as a result, instead of consulting these essentially established economics profession, uh, uh, 364 of whom wrote a letter uh, in the early 80s opposing her economic policies, uh, but rather relied on think tanks to provide people who are already died in the neoliberal wool, so to speak, to provide advice to the government. So this sidelined whole swaths of intellectual life in the UK. Meanwhile, of course, academic life also became ever more narrowly specialized and irrelevant in the decades that followed. With the ascendancy of neoliberalism, which, by the way, I don't consider intellectual at all. Many people think that neoliberalism has essentially intellectually conquered the world. This is actually not true. And I make this very clear in my study of Thatcherite intellectuals. And I think the lessons can also be extended to other parts. It's it was really more a sectarian obsession, and it really is, in fact, an intellectually bankrupt way of thinking right from its beginnings in the late 19th century, but certainly remains true today, because it is the ultimate in what Marx used to call vulgar economy. It was an intellectually bankrupt effort to legitimize capitalism as though it were still competitive capitalism, even though it had already arrived at its monopoly phase. And it is not a surprise that neoliberalism has never hegemonized society. It has never won hearts and minds, as Mrs. Thatcher set out to do. Its reach among the common people is shallow. Political disaffection is rife. And rather than neoliberalism conquering the world intellectually and ideologically, what we have seen over the neoliberal period is the increasing loosening of the leaderships of all the major parties, including formerly social democratic parties, which have become committed to neoliberalism, thanks to bankrolling by big corporations, etc. And the vast mass of ordinary people among whom these leaderships find it very difficult to win votes and find very difficult to win the ideological argument. And also neoliberalism does not have effective directive capacity. It does not have effective ideas in the face of the mounting contradictions of capitalism, which have only mounted at an accelerated pace since the onset of neoliberalism. Because if you free capital from the shackles of social obligations, state regulation, taxation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and free it to do what it wants, it will it's inevitably uh, uh, lead. Uh, it will inevitably exacerbate the contradictions of capitalism. 
in the in the period since the 70s we have also seen the passage to postmodernism and the attack on grand nar narratives which is itself uh, essentially a, 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 well, on the one hand a throwing in of the intellectual towel and on the other hand the inevitable degeneration of intellectual life thanks to social the fateful social scientific division of labor, which was inaugurated by neoclassical economics. I could say a lot here, but basically what I want to say is that a, a really interesting studies could be written about how the degeneration of intellectual life that we see right now actually goes back to the late 19th century and the advent of the modern social sciences, beginning with um, economics and its separation from sociology. Economics got separated from sociology. We have further seen a shift to culturalism, which, uh, by the way, has is not just about culture. It actually involves a generalized acceptance of neoclassical, neoliberal views of the economy. So just as you see the all the major parties essentially combining some version of neoliberalism with a little bit of diversity politics, uh, in a similar way, the shift to culturalism actually involves on the further left, actually involves an acceptance of neoclassical economics. Um, and also from in the previous era, one of the other major shifts we've seen is that in the previous era, one of the reasons why uh, essentially the mainstream of intellectuals in most societies tended to side with at least with the working class parties as they were, reformist though they may have been, imperialist though they may have been, but you found the critical elements of intellectual life siding with working class intellectuals. And this was often attributed to the overproduction of intellectuals. There were essentially far more intellectuals being produced than there was a uh, demand for in terms of putting them in, in the structures of capitalist society. But from that position, we have now gone to the underproduction of intellectuals because with the expansion of the Keynesian welfare state and, and, and subsequent that expansion did not, uh, you know, did not shrink very much in the post second world war period. It was only reorient in the neoliberal period. It was only reoriented towards a neo in a neoliberal direction. So the vast apparatuses of the corporate capitalist state and of course the vast expansion of the apparatuses of private capitalist firms themselves so the number of educated people that were employed in the uh, 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 by monopoly capital itself directly also vastly expanded so that essentially we are looking at a situation in which if you have a degree you are invited to join the capitalist class either serve it through the state or serve it through um through a uh, directly working for for capital so there is a, an enormous uh, uh, opportunity to do that and therefore the tendency of these people to go towards working class parties is that much less and indeed there's another element of the story which i'll come to in a minute so essentially we've gone from intellectuals as a group to practically the creation of a professional managerial class as something in between a group and a class of its own and now I come to the point that I want to make, which I think is really important. So Harold Perkins wrote, uh, he's a sociologist, he wrote a big fat book called The Rise of Professional Society. And it is really about the post Second World War working uh, uh, evolution of the intellectual life. And in it, he points out that there was a vast expansion of the professional managerial class and, and, and so on. And then he says that what you saw as the decades wore on, particularly in the neoliberal era, is that there was a, now a cleavage within this capitalist, uh, within this professional managerial class. And this is how he defined the cleavage. He says the main line of cleavage ran between those employed by the private or profit-oriented sector and the public sector, including the non-profit making institutions such as universities, churches, and charitable foundations. So what he's saying is that you've got two types of uh, uh, professional managerial classes, one that worked directly for the big corporations, the lawyers, the engineers, the financiers, what have you, and, and the consultants, of course, and those who worked for either the state, the large welfare bureaucracy, etc., all NGOs. But I also point out that there is something else that happened, uh, and that is that uh, in addition, you may think that they, these then were sort of, you know, opposed to one another, but no, 
as you know, one of the big events of the period of neoliberalism was that, you know, for a while in the 1970s, right wing parties moved further to the right and left wing parties moved further to the left. But by the close of the 70s, certainly by the 80s, what actually happened is that right wing parties had already moved to the right and the so-called left of center parties followed them to the right, moving the entire political spectrum to the right. So what you now had and, and, and the architects of the move of the left-wing parties to the right were in fact precisely those members of the professional middle class who were working for the state or the whether in health education etc the state sector as uh, uh, and the ngo sector and the universities etc these were the people who, for example, in the UK were the Blairites or in the US were the Clintonites, etc. And they essentially uh, moved social democracy to the right, uh, creating this cross-party consensus on neoliberal economic policy, and then differing with right parties only on certain social issues, which is why we have essentially a situation in which politics has been reduced to culture wars, because culture is the only thing that these parties actually disagree about, if they disagree at all, because there are other things to say there. So essentially, that's what happened. And so is so what we have, therefore, so that's what happened in the mainstream political parties. This also had repercussions for further forces further to the left, because the emergence of neoliberalism has led, uh, uh, has led to a situation where the left has essentially become married to a form of Proudhonist economics, which you can say is the left's version of neoliberalism, because it still imagines that some kind of an unregulated, uh, non-state directed free market economics is going to work. And in terms of um, uh, of the rest of policy, it, it basically uh, accepts uh, a so certain type of diversity politics, etc., which, of course, will be based on what I call network politics. So essentially, uh, through the neoliberal period, forces further to the left have become married to a form of Proudhonist economics, which is against any form of planning and network politics, which is against any form of party. So planning and party are out. They are ejected. They are part of the old world of meta narratives and so on. And of course, with no one to represent their genuine interests, ordinary working class pe people have been either bereft of serious leadership, disaffected from parties of the left of center, or they have some of them, not all of them, but some of them have become prey to populist politics. So uh, we have a rhetorical polarization around, around culture wars that represents uh, the, uh, the absence of real polarization around economic issues in political life. We have witnessed a descent of political discourse into barely disguised justifications for the pursuit of the increasingly incoherent interests of the corporate financialized corporate class. There is in fact no serious intellectual life. So there is a divide on the one hand between the professional managerial class and the working class and also this class and the third world because remember also that along with the expansion, the demand for professional managerial class is so great that um, first world countries have taken to importing uh, 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 their professional managerial intellectuals from third world countries, which is also why, of course, a certain type of politics of diversity have become absolutely necessary for capitalism. Uh, so uh, essentially what you also see is that the professional managerial class is disproportionately represented in the first world countries, whereas in third world countries, they are disproportionately underrepresented given the needs of society and even of whatever deformed type of capitalism you may have there if they are capitalist societies, which they usually are. Okay, so to conclude then, what are we looking at? This is the scenario, this is the diagnosis. It's not complete and because it's not complete, it's harder to discern what we are to see in the future. Will we see uh, the neo ne neoliberal financialized capitalism itself become so incoherent and chaotic as to lose the allegiance of the professional managerial class that has so far served it so well, just as it seems to be losing the allegiance of small and even medium business. Of course, what form this is going to take is not clear, and it may not necessarily take a progressive form. 
form. It can take the form of these people defecting to various forms of populism, which is not going to help working class people. It's not going to help the cause of socialism. Second possibility will be, will working class people organize themselves organically them on their own by finally producing their organic intellectuals who can also hegemonize the rest of the professional managerial class and the rest of society, give the working class a real project, become political and directive, give them a real project of socialism, which is uh, which is capable of being realized, will we see some other scenario? I don't know, but I hope you found what I had to say uh, interesting in parts, at least. Thank you so much. And, and with that, we conclude the presentation uh, section of a, an event that I think covers a, a, a paramount uh, question for progressive forces today. And uh, with that, we can go into the next section of today's events which is questions from the audience. For folks with questions at the bottom of the Zoom, you'll see a little option that says reactions. Just click anything. You don't have to click the hand up, but uh, click whatever you want. That'll notify me and then I'll be able to call on you. But uh, Noah, you had a question. I don't actually. I just wanted to say that we might get questions from our uh, live stream on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter as well. Uh, so if those happen, I will put my hand up and relay them to you. Or to whom yeah, and I saw we, we also received a couple financial contributions from there from Dino and Cobra Commander. So thank you uh, to those who have, who have contributed financially. Um, uh, David. Uh, you're muted, David. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Right. Hi. I, I can't afford to go to a dentist. I don't get health care. That's only for the rich, the affluent, you know. So I'm left out of the capitalist system, you know. Absolutely. That's the condition most of us here in the States are in. The heart of the belly of the beast, the heart of contemporary imperialism. But most of us can't go check our teeth, our eyesight, or other things. Um, that, was, that, uh, was that just a comment, or did you have a question along with that? If not, we can move over uh, to to so Not just a comment, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, yeah. can, I, uh, can I comment on his comment? I, I, I guess so. Yeah, I just want to be brief. Um, that's everybody, and I, I was trying to get to pulling everything together at the end of my presentation, but as you saw, I kind of ramble, uh, so I apologize. Uh, but we're with you. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, Radical? Are you muted still? I just have a couple of uh, uh, questions. Uh, one is a general question, but it arises from Glenn's uh, point, but it also relates to many of the things, other things, uh, things that other people were saying. But, you know, can we say that think tanks produce knowledge, or should we say something else? I mean, are we using knowledge in a kind a technical sense uh, or in a more substantial sense. And my second question was just a clarification, uh, Glenn. You were talking about uh, the military-industrial complex and its contribution to the U.S. economy. And I just wondered if you have a, if you have better, uh, if, if you have a, 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 a more elaborate uh, 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 measurements of it than simply the knowledge that we can have, which anybody can get from Wikipedia, that, you know, the U.S. spends around one trillion a year on its economy, which is out of a 20 trillion um, uh, GDP, roughly speaking, so it's about 5% of GDP, but that does not seem to be quite big enough, or, or I don't know, we can comment on that. That's it for now. Thank you. Well, in, in terms of the numbers, I it, uh, this is uh, part of the problems for the people who was looking into the think tanks because they don't necessarily report on, on all the numbers. It's just what they do report on uh, makes it uh, abund abundantly clear that the, the, yeah, the arms manufacturers are the main, uh, the main, yeah, they're the main financiers of uh, pretty much all of them, uh, this... Uh, of this uh, think tank, so it it is quite remarkable um, in terms of what, what it translates into. So, for example, I, I focused a lot on how the the think tanks provides you know the the information for the for the 
uh, for, for government as well as to put in the media to you know mobilize public support. But uh, but but it's also quite remarkable how they actually almost by, by of politicians. If you look at the the political leaders, the ones in pretty much every administration in the United States, uh, pretty much all of them are affiliated with think tanks. This is the revolving door. This is when, whenever they're out of office, that's where they get hired for their, you know, expertise. And then when they get back in, they're pretty much yeah, still on the payroll. Uh, so I'm not sure if I understood the question right in terms of creating knowledge, uh, whether or not it's disinformation or knowledge. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a good. That's a. A, a different concept would almost have to be used because in academia we say, you know, the purpose of academia is the creation of knowledge, uh, but uh, it's not what they're doing. <laughs> it's not the pursuit of truth. It's uh, it, it's a business. So they are producing the, uh, well, not, yeah, that's a good point. We can't really, really use knowledge, can we? Uh, but yeah, producing, well, that's information or fake information required uh, to push specific policies, and um, yeah, it's uh, not not with the knowledge. I would think that uh, the maximizing security would have the central focus, but of course, that's not uh, what what this is about. This is about driving profit margins. So uh, I'm not sure if I missed the question there, but yeah. Not at all. In fact, uh, I just remembered that I often say that you know people talk about fake news. But very few, few, very few people talk about fake scholarship, which is kind of what's happening a lot right now, exactly by the mechanisms that you mentioned. So, fake scholarship, yeah. No, I think uh, should have used that term. <laughs> I like it a lot more, more already. Thanks. Thank you, thank you all for for the question and the response. I, I think this gets at a topic that we we we, we might consider doing another panel on, which is ideology. Some of the central debates have been between the neutral functionalist understanding and the epistemologically laden question of false consciousness and all these other things. And the scholarship likes to separate uh, whether one has to take one approach or the other. I tend to think you can uh, reconcile both. Um, uh, we have a, a couple hands up. I see David. I don't know if that's the, the lingering hand from, from last time or is that a, a new hand that went up? And I also see Noah. I know that Noah brought the, the hand up as well. So, um, uh, I guess no. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a question from our YouTube live. Uh, Jimmy Shoot asks, "How can how can communists prevent an influx of opportunistic intellectuals to the party as soon as it gets into power?" And I'd like to briefly comment on this, if I if I could. Um, this is actually something the Bolsheviks experienced historically, and uh, the way that they dealt with it led to quite a lot of problems, right? Uh, we had the purges. Uh, they were in a very bad place and a very bad time. Um, but right now, where we are, we already have these opportunists within these organizations. We already have this within the left movement in general. And so I think the solution for us is uh, getting everyone, uh, and I mean everyone, not just intellectuals, but uh, every working class person and that comes in to at least understand the very basics of Marxism, right? To be able to understand the world dialectically, to ascend to the concrete. If we all at least come from this uh, point of view, then the opportunists are very clearly seen as soon as they come around coming from a different point of view, right? In our age of... of uh, post COINTEL Pro and the sophistication of surveillance and the ruling class, there's no other solution. Uh, the, the notion that we could keep an organization uh, infiltration free, I think, is laughable. As, as soon as it gets powerful enough to be embraced by the masses, it will already be uh, infiltrated. But that education, that very basics for everybody. And this is one of the actual things I was going to end my, my whole presentation with is not only the uh, reconnection of radical intellectuals and working people, but the relationship that is necessary for us to move forward. 
Thank you. Um, uh, of the panelists, anyone want to address uh, Jimmy Shoots' uh, question? I see a couple hands up. Radic, I don't know if yours was to answer that or, or a new question. Uh, I've raised my hand because Alan has a question. So whenever you're ready for Alan's question. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, Gab uh, Gabriel, I think uh, you raised it right after Jimmy's question. Do you want to address that one? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. And it is true that historically, all of the actually existing socialist states have had to deal with a fundamental problem. And that problem I would describe as the kind of dialectics of socialism. You need to develop the productive forces in order to not be crushed by the imperialist powers. In order to do that, you need to rely on the expertise of the intelligentsia. And often historically, depending on the country that we're talking about, the intelligentsia has been, you know, uh, subjected to various forms of opportunism and tending to pitch to empire because that's how you have the best career opportunities. And so how do you resolve that contradiction of the need of expertise and intellectuals while knowing full well that the intelligentsia has often historically pitched to empire? And I think there are a number of different, you know, historical examples that we could look into, but I'll just highlight one because I think that it did this relatively successfully. If you're familiar with uh, Fidel Castro's words to intellectuals, one of the things that he did is he outlined the important fact that those who are diehard revolutionaries are already part of the cause. Like we don't have to worry about them, they're gonna contribute. Those who are on the fence, which are the overwhelming majority of the intellectuals in the Cuban case, at least as far as Castro described it, are the ones who are wavering and they could go either way. And then there's the hardcore anti-revolutionaries or counter-revolutionaries that obviously we have to wage war against. And so his famous claim that, you know, dentro de la revolución todo, contra la revolución nada. So within the revolution, everything meaning even those petty bourgeois intellectuals who are on the fence, we need them, we need to work with them, we need to convince them that the cause is worth fighting for. And it's only the real counter-revolutionaries that we need to wage war against. This is a difficult and very complicated procedure, but I think it adds something to the discussion that we've had thus far, because I think a lot of us are speaking from our own context, of course, which tend to be the imperial core, but within actually existing socialism, and I would say even within the imperial core, we do also need to insist on the struggle to bring people into the struggle who are basically sitting on the fence or in the words that Carlos used earlier, there are the kind of radical intelligentsia that want to appear radical but aren't. We also have to, just as Lenin said, we have to wage our struggles against every class stratum. And we actually have to bring those people into the struggle and convince them to be on our side because our side is the winning side. Beautifully said. Yeah, I uh, couldn't agree more. The uh, ruling class can only survive on the basis of divide and conquer. And we have to counter that with various forms of, of, of unity across different uh, popular classes, contending classes to the ruling elite. Um, uh, no, I saw you raise your hand. Was it to answer the question or a new question? Because if not, we'll go to Radhika. Get all the answers first. Every time I raise my hand, it will be for a question from the live stream. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Radhika, uh, we can proceed. Uh, you, you mentioned Hi. it was Alan's question. So, yeah. Alan, Alan is going to ask his question. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes. I, I, my question is 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 a kind of category question, but I'm going to start off by putting two very evocative issues. But was the Soviet bureaucracy composed of intellectuals? Right. Um, two is Car is Keir Starmer an organic intellectual? Right. Th this this is why because. All these people were in the generic sense intellectuals, right? Now, the Marxist movement had a couple of categories which it used to use to describe people who we would now talk about as intellectuals. One, one was middle class, which is not really a Marxist term, but, uh, you know, are intellectuals inherently middle class? That would be sort of question number one, right? You know, working class the organic in the sense that you come out of the working class, but can it also be organic in the sense that that's what you do? I think teachers are working class because that's what they do, right? Now, the second question then is, are they petty bourgeois? Because in Marx's time, and he refers to the identities, always speaks of the petty bourgeoisie as the, the class that the, bourge, that the fascists attract. But uh, it's 
kind of conventional, but not very useful in, in the move I was involved in, which were Trotsky's, to kind of lump together shopkeepers and teachers. And, you know, they're all petty bourgeois, right? I, I, I don't find that useful. So are intellectuals petty bourgeois? If not, what is petty bourgeois? It's clear that we don't live in a society in which the petty bourgeoisie are all shopkeepers, much as I love shopkeepers. But if so, who are the petty bourgeoisie? Is the term useful at all? And, you know, finally, this ties together the, 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 the function of the, the, the Soviet state bureaucracy. Surely what intellectuals of the wrong sort, no, what intellectuals do is they run bureaucracies, right? Well, are there good bureaucracies and are there bad bureaucracies? Thank you so much for, for that question, Alan. Uh, very important question. Um, do we have any uh, uh, answers? Uh, Noah, do you want to address that? Yeah, one? I I'd love to uh, argue with Alan a little bit here. <laughs> um, Alan, I, I love you, uh, but uh, I think middle class is a Marxist term. I think it's a term Marx and Engels use quite a bit. Um, in 18th Brumaire, uh, Marx speaks of the bourgeoisie originally developing as a middle class, uh, and he speaks about the ideological problems that brings with it, uh, such as the inability to recognize themselves as part of an entire class structure and seeing themselves as above class antagonism. But I think the problem is the way we're trained to think of middle class is not Marxist, right? Um, so uh, for what would a middle class be for Marxism, which is really the essential content of what Alan is saying, right? Uh, and that would be anything that stands somewhere between the ruling uh, class and the class it's in contradiction with, right? Just somewhere between it. That's all you gotta be. So the PMC would be this, right? Uh, Engels speaks of bourgeoisification in all of his talk about the conditions of the working class in England, right? And he actually comments that when uh, people start owning homes, they're no longer within the pro proletariat. So what are they in this case, right? They're clearly not a shopkeeper, like Alan is saying, but they are within a middle class. And it's funny because this is where all my study recently has been directed uh, because of the reproletarianization theory I've been working on, because this is what, what it all uh, encapsulates. So, yeah, um, I, I really wish I could just go here. Here's my pamphlet, but it's not published yet. It is finished. But we're just, it's in line behind another book. So, uh, yeah, that's thats it. Right. I'm going to leave my hand up, though, because after we're done, I'll have questions. Have a question from, from the live audience. Yeah. Uh, Radhika. Yeah, can I just put, and actually, oh, uh, I thought Gabriel has had his hand up as well. But um, I just wanted to say very quickly that, uh, first of all, uh, there are various ways of defining the working class, but to me, the best definition is that the working class is everyone who must work for a living, whether they are paid for it or not, and whether they are employed or not. I think, to me, that's a working class, but that's a very broad definition and that would include the, the professional middle class, most of the professional middle classes. Um, a second thing is that uh, Pulanzas, of course, and, and I, I know Gabriel has some difficulties with this, so I want to hear what he says. Pulanzas, of course, distinguish uh, the old petty bourgeoisie and the new petty bourgeoisie. So, uh, and the new petty bourgeoisie is precisely what we are calling the professional middle classes. So, in that sense, at least that distinction is there, and I, I, we, we need to discuss it and its significance and what we can do with it, or whether we should simply discard it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I just thought I would bring those two points up. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Gaber, if you don't want to reply to that, maybe I have a, a, a quick comment uh, before we get to the question that Noah has. But um... I, I can say quickly, I think that uh, Poulant's work and there's other people like Albert Zemanski and others on the new petty bourgeoisie, I think is quite helpful. They're not shopkeepers in the traditional sense, obviously class formations, because class formations are relations. They evolve with the evolution of capitalism and that 
uh, the position that he takes and what I agree with him on, and I think that you do too, Radhika, is that the new petty bourgeoisie tends to operate at a kind of managerial level. And he does insist on the strong Marxist point that at the end of the day, there are only really two classes. And so he tends to use vocabulary of class strata or class fractions or things like this, meaning that there are those who own the means of production and those who uh, are uh, need to work for them in order to survive or find other ways of surviving. And so in that regard, the new petty bourgeoisie is this managerial class stratum that itself is ultimately working for the capitalists who have employed them in order to manage the workers. And so there's this kind of middle stratum, if you will. And I think that that is helpful for understanding some of the ways in which that stratum has evolved in the 20th century. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, in uh, in Spanish, we have a concept that's not, uh, it doesn't translate the same to English, which is el pueblo. Uh, it's got a very popular, um, latent uh, meaning in, in, in Spanish. And in English, when you say the people, it's like, well, you know, it's, uh, the, the bourgeoisie use the people quite often, but uh, their bourgeois counterparts in Latin America, they're not using el pueblo. That's a uh, popular. Um, and I, I think that is uh, a term that describes the a concept that um, some folks in our tradition, some of the the folks that some people might consider a bit scary, that Stalin um, uh, described it as the working masses. There was a distinction between the working class and the working masses, um, which were working people of different sorts, but they weren't the traditional uh, industrial uh, proletariat. Um, it's a term that in the U.S. through uh, William Z. Foster gets described as the toiling masses. Um, and it's a way of speaking about perhaps this broader coalition of the people or el, el pueblo, uh, which are composed of different classes, all finding themselves in a contradictory position to the bourgeoisie, um, and perhaps uh, finding themselves in in uh, in a series of contradictions amongst the people themselves. And I think that part of what we're discussing here are two classes uh, uh, or, or stratums of, of the working masses that both have contradictions with the ruling class, but that find themselves uh, with a certain degree of contradictions amongst the people um, that have been, of course, proliferated by that ruling class. Um, but uh, uh, if there's if there's no other comments on that question, Noah, uh, you have a question yeah. from the audience? Yeah, I actually have a quick comment on that. Um, my presentation, as long and rambly as it was, actually went over this very point. Um, and I think it's one that we could convene a panel to speak on, because without understanding, understanding the rise and fall of, of this this group that we're talking about right now, we can't really understand where we are. Um, and so it will be great to have a, a whole range of opinions discussed on it. For me, it's really always, always about going back to basic dialectics, right? And Engels in uh, anti during and Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, where he explains that the, the contradiction between bourgeoisie and proletariat, between owners and workers, arises as a reflection of production itself changing. The old relations of production are outmoded by the new forces of production, right? And that process doesn't stop just at industrial capitalism. It goes on into imperialism. And we seem to have this whole, at the second stage of imperialism after Lenin, where we don't have an answer yet. Anyway, uh, I, I'm not going to ramble even more. So this question is from uh, Reclaim Dasin, who says, this is primarily for uh, Rakim. In which way can an intellectual avoid becoming the ultra one? That is to say, the discursive manifestation of the university discourse. Well, I don't think there's a, a magic pill, but... A lot of it has to do with your the fundamental alignment of your theoretical practice. So what it is that you do as an intellectual. And for the sake of brevity, I would say that there are two fundamental orientations that I often encounter within the realm of the intelligentsia. The overwhelming majority of intellectuals are invested in a theoretical practice that is rooted in exchange value. And that consists in branding themselves and promoting their consumer products and using those to leverage up their careers and climb the social ladder. 
that's as Carlos kind of quite eloquently put it in more existential terms. This is what day in and day out people are trained to do. They're conditioned opportunists, if you will. But there's another form of theoretical practice that I think most of us on this call, if not all of us, because uh, I don't know everyone, uh, would identify with. And that is uh, an intellectual practice that is dedicated to use value. And that's very different because it's not about coming up with a brand and marketing yourself and getting a following and all of this. It's about actually trying to develop forms of analysis that have real purchase in the world and connect with working people and the struggles for a more egalitarian society and a more sustainable society. And so at core, I think we really have to, as intellectuals, we have to ask ourselves these fundamental existential questions. What side are you on? Are you on the side of the opportunists and are you pitching to empire and the capitalist ruling class in order to advance your career? Or are you on the side of those who are trying to, as difficult as it is, and fits and starts with setbacks and with loss in career opportunities as well, those who are trying to make a better world and who want to contribute intellectual tools to doing that, and therefore you're invested in real use value, often, again, at the expense of career and at the expense of uh, visibility and other such things. So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, thank you so much, Gabriel. I see. I think my my right contact is falling out. So tremendous uh, time for for such an occurrence. Oh, uh, you're um, you're crying, Carlos. It's good. Yeah, it's you good. you made me emotional. I'm glad you teared up. Um, <laughs> uh, Radical, I saw your hand up, and uh, I think Noah also has a question from from the live audience. But uh, Radica, um, ask your question. Right. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, insofar as we're talking about all, I mean, this has been such a valuable conversation and I think it needs to continue. So I'm, I, we, we can discuss the possibility of doing another uh, another webinar, but I just want to throw in a theme that I think should be part of that webinar in a small or big way. And that is that there is something very peculiar about neoliberalism. We have to understand just how intellectually dishonest it is. Right from the beginning, right from the moment of its emergence, it has essentially tried to deny the fact that capitalism is fake. Then, when you put that to point at which capitalism is is essentially past its sell by date, it, it it is ready to be overcome. And so, the point is that essentially, for the last century and a half, if I we, I want to be extreme, we are paying the price of keeping capitalism alive. And therefore, many of the distortions and many of the, uh, how can you call it? Uh, yeah, many of the distortions and, 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 and involutions of intellectual life itself should be connected with this fact. Um, so, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to, to say that we really need to bring that element of the theory of neoliberalism and the the the, the fact that capital, monopoly capitalism is finished is into into the picture. Thank you so much. Totally agree. Uh, Noah? Yeah, this question comes from Cristino Almonte, who asks, as we see the rise of, multipol of the multipolar world, and as America slips more into fascism, what can we as intellectuals take advantage of uh, the, the ensuing, or how can we as intellectuals take advantage of the ensuing anarchy? Why haven't we formed a workers coalition? Uh, I'd like to take a quick stab at this if I could first, if that's okay. Yes, uh, go right ahead. Um, I think the, the, the problem is actually what I've been sort of hinting at uh, earlier in that we have a working mass who sees falsification as what Marxism is. Uh, so as Marxist intellectuals specifically, and as uh, um, radicals more broadly, we must, must, must find a way to engage in this sort of what Gramsci would call war oppositions by drawing a distinct line between them and us somehow. Uh, they are absolutely trying to disguise themselves with our symbols, our old slogans. I, I see every single day Marxism uh, being used, but liberalism in substance. So finding a way to build something large enough uh, 
to and well funded enough and with enough um, theoretical correctness behind it to sort of shout down falsification, I think is the only way to do it in our era. Um, and, and that includes, you know, projects like we're all involved in already. So I would say, get involved in something like this. If you have something to contribute, everyone wants more help, wants to grow bigger, wants to include more people. You know what I mean? Uh, but that's it. I'll shut up. I can uh, I can add maybe an important thing, uh, and this, uh, unless there is disagreement, can maybe function as the, the last question uh, we approach. But the UAW, one of the largest unions in the country, just recently endorsed a ceasefire. And the language that they used in that endorsement was very radical. It, it, it breaks quite a bit with the traditions of, uh, of, of an aristocracy of labor that um, you know, just went right along with imperialism and, and genocides and these horrendous things that, that we saw in the 20th century and that we continue to see in this century. Um, it's after winning a decisive victory against the big three automobile companies, Stellantis, Ford, General Motors, as soon as it got the contract, it decided we're going to organize all unorganized workers within the automobile industry and said that we, we want to schedule our contracts to end on the last day of April. Why? So that potentially all other unions, as they suggested in the country, can strike on the 1st of May, which as we know is International Workers' Day. It's not celebrated as International Workers' Day in the U.S., even though the event that it traces its roots to is in the U.S., in Chicago, the Haymarket riots. So I think we're already seeing a process whereby the the working class foundation of a working class struggle for power is developing at, at the same time as the anti-imperialist struggle is expanding to levels of popularity that I don't think we've seen since perhaps the the anti-Vietnam uh, uh, movement movement against the 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 war on Vietnam. You know the percentage of the youth, you know people from eighteen to thirty five years of age that support a ceasefire and that have in their thinking deep sympathies with the plight of the Palestinians is nearing the 70 to 80% range. That is just completely unheard of. These are people that have already made slits in bourgeois narratives in one area, and like the, those fabrics that one tries to rip them apart, and uh, when they're fully compact, you can't do it. But once you get the slightest bit of a slit into that fabric, you just rip it right apart quite easily. These are people that, by having questioned bourgeois narratives in one area, they're open to blowing the whole thing open. It's up to us to come to them and explain. People want to make sense of the world. And in my view, you know, uh, I, I, I guess most people here share it, it is only Marxism that allows us to make sense of the world, to understand the concrete concretely. So I, I think in previous eras, perhaps we could have looked at some divisions in the working class, things like racism and, and other factors as what is rooting the failure for the conquest for power? I think today we have to look at the left. We have to look at ourselves and how we can become better, more approachable, more flexible, um, how we can be better organizers, how we can learn how to start from the common sense of our people and reorient the rational kernels towards socialism, which in a country as large as the U.S. and as culturally diverse, according to various regions, it means that we cannot have a one-size-fits-all, copy-paste approach. We have to adjust to the spe specificities of the concrete conditions that we're working in. But- uh, so I just want to add something. Yeah. The first uh, Labor Day parade I attended in 1995, the front banner was the ILA. And it was, it read, ILA means I love America. That was my introduction to American class politics. It's gone, it's finished, it's ended. Because we have a generation that is says, I think my job and my position and my status and my progress through the apparatus of the American state machine is less important than my human beings for what's happening to the different women and people of Gaza. 
And this is transitional moment. And that's what we've been talking about. So I, I just think we it's so wonderful to be with people who support and defend everybody who stands with Palestine and chooses to stand up, even if the cost of any prospect of becoming a member of the bourgeoisie is, is taken from them. That's what solidarity really means. And I just welcome everybody here. We've just arrived in London. We confront this ghastly man, Keir Starmer, who, who is actually an appointee of the state. This is proven. Uh, who now runs the labor organization of uh, British working class. Uh, let's hope his days are numbered. Thank you so much for, the, for that, Alan. Um, and as we wrap up, I want to remind you all that all sorts of events that we do nowadays as socialists uh, have to, uh, at, at some level, uh, discuss the most principal uh, dilemma we have in front of us, which is an ongoing genocide of the Palestinian people. And the way that we've been thinking about this at the Institute has been uh, the fact that there's two races. We have one race for a ceasefire to end the genocide, and we have to go as broad as we can with that race. And then there's a longer, uh, that's the sprint, and there's the longer marathon uh, race, which is for justice, for removing the conditions that, uh, you know, in Kantian terms, create the conditions for the possibility of something such as what we're witnessing at the moment. And I, you know, my view that takes the form of one secular uh, state where, you know, uh, Palestinian uh, Christians, Jews, and Muslims can live peacefully as they did before the intervention of imperialism in the region. Um, but uh, uh, before we head out, I, I, I see that Gabriel had to go, but I think it would be good to, uh, as we've done in the past, do a plug for the various organizations that, um, that uh, co-sponsored this event. Radhika, do you want to tell us a little bit about the IMG, uh, some of the work that you're doing, and where folks can find you? Uh, sure. Um, I, I guess uh, the International Manifesto Group started in the year 2020, uh, when a bunch of us were trying to figure out uh, exactly, you know, how to make sense of the fast-paced changes that were taking place. And we uh, started having group discussions. And then by the uh, end of the year, we started having webinars and we've not looked back since. We are basically, we have since published a manifesto. It's called uh, Through Pluripolarity Towards Socialism, which you can find on our website. It's www.internationalmanifesto.org. So please consider reading the manifesto. Please consider signing it. Please volunteer if you would like. Uh, join us, donate to us, whatever you like to do. All of these things can be done via the website. And thanks very much for your attention. And we hope to come back in the new year with... Um, another a whole range of very important and webinars which we hope you'll join us in thanks thank you so much radical yeah please do make sure to check out the img become a signatory um and and, and promote it as, as much as you can because uh, you all are doing great work um uh we will make sure to link the uh all of the institutional links to img the uh, critical theory workshop to the folks watching the stream through youtube live um, and I think it's been linked to, to everything else we have promoted. As far as the Institute, uh, it's uh, been around for some years now, and uh, it's, it's, it's an attempt to find some clarity um, in, in our confusing and, and complex uh, time. And our, our methodology is, is Marxism. We um, have uh, everything from a publishing press to a journal to um, you know weeks where we do five or, or, or six uh, broadcasts. Uh, now we just started doing broadcasts in Spanish with various specialists uh, from around the world. And we do things like interviews, cover the news, and we have a website where we publish articles. And we have a Marxism school um, where we teach um, anywhere from 30 to, to 50, 60 people uh, various classes. I taught one uh, recently on Marxism and the history of Western philosophy. Noah has taught one on uh, the basics of Marxism. We recently have a uh, party, major uh, party here in the U.S. that has approached us to, to provide this class for, for their cadre that Noah would be leading. We have other classes. We're currently running a class uh, educated against genocide, um, which is looking at the history of Zionism, imperialism, and, and the Palestinian plight, where we have various specialists come on and give classes. We just had Dan Cohen uh, this past Thursday 
come on and, and, and give a class. And that class is led by Professor Danny Shaw, another professor of the Institute and at uh, City University of New York. But that's, uh, I think that's all I have in terms of the, the plug for the Institute. Uh, no, I see your hand up. Is, is it quick? Because we're wrapping up here. Super, super quick. I just want to say that you can find uh, where you can sign up for our classes, both Educate Against Genocide uh, and anything else that might be coming in the future, such as Basics of Marxism, which will be running again soon in our link tree, on our website, on our YouTube, wherever. Yeah, and that's just MidwesternMarks.com. Um, and as for Gabriel, again, another terrific organization. Please do check out the Critical Theory Workshop. We'll have all the links um, where uh, you can find them in the description to these videos. Uh, so with that, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to all of those who are watching live. Thank you to those who were able to make financial contributions. Thank you to our speakers. Um, and uh, I think this was a tremendous event, trying to our, our best to tackle a monumental topic. And I think we did a, a fairly good job. Um, so um, with that, uh, we'll get going. We can stop the recording or you can stop the live. And yeah, thank you. I'm Michael Hudson. I'm appearing here for the International Manifesto Group. If you like this video and want to like it, please subscribe. For more information, go to the address on the screen.